Goodness gracious. A very good morning to all of you and welcome to the pre-show show of the morning safari. Um, and if you are just joining us, you will understand in five minutes exactly what I mean. We're going to be doing a live safari for the next three hours. I was just thinking about the poor people who are waking up in Johannesburg or the other big cities in the world. I'm thinking specifically Johannesburg just in terms of time zones. Um, who have to face the actual morning traffic on a Tuesday morning as opposed to just a herd of impala that are kind of were a little bit in the way but have now all casually moved off and I know we're not on our actual live safari but I would very much like to sit and watch the baby impala because I find them thoroughly entertaining and also it's slightly astounding just how many little baby impala there are at the <laughs> wee <laughs> hop skip jump just how many baby impala there truly are on quarantine this morning. Quarantine is the great open area. I say the great open area. It is an open area outside of our camps where we live. So you might have seen the sign a little bit earlier as I drove forward. But it's right outside the camp. And somehow, somewhere at some time, <laughs> look at them getting to know each other. <laughs> the Impala Ewes all gave birth somewhere right next to us. We never saw it, but at some point it happened, and now the place feels like it's teeming with knee-high Impala. And they are, quite frankly, utterly adorable. And one has to wonder how they perceive their new world. Is it all very, very exciting? All the scratches to be scratched, all the grass to be eaten. <laughs> All the friends to be made, all the jumps to be jumped. Or is it an utterly terrifying new place? I'm not sure. I don't know how Baby and Parlor perceive their new world. But I like to think they're slightly overjoyed to be here. Oh, look at those two. <laughs> it's adorable. One of the few antelope, as a little fun fact that will not extend to the live... Well, it will extend at some point to the live drives, but not this morning. Impala are one of the few antelope that aloe groom. In other words, they groom each other. And already the, the little ones are showing signs of doing it. Morning! Oh, hop, skip, jump. And gone. You are utterly adorable. Whee! Where are you going, you silly thing? Stop causing panic in the ranks. Oh, we've all gone now. <laughs> Too sweet. Jandre, where should we go this morning? Uh, see, some wild dogs. see some wild dogs. Okay, sorry everybody, Byron is attempting to to bend my ear. Standing by. Okay, copy that. Awesome, enjoy. I'm going to take Western Boundary and then Southern Boundary all the way to CP and to see whether or not Shadow went in or out. Oh, Byron has a surprise for you, but to tell you right now would be to give the game away. So obviously you heard that he's got something for you all. I'm not going to tell you what it is until the live safari starts. And you only have to patiently wait for 45 seconds until you find out exactly what it is that Byron has found for you. In the meantime, you may or may not have heard that we will be checking the boundaries of our wonderful reserve to see whether or not Shadow is still around. Yesterday we failed to find her, so we're going to try again this morning. Luckily, all of the Impala that you just looked at now managed to avoid Shadow and Karula. Bye-bye, Impala, and bye-bye to all of you. I will see you very shortly in a far more official context. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. We have just found a beautiful young female leopard 
This is so exciting and this is Safari Live. Good morning, everyone. Isn't this amazing? What a great start. We've just found the young female leopard. It appears to be Shongile. And funnily enough, she looks like she's alone for the moment. I wonder if her mother, Karula, has left her in this area. Let's see if she has a drink, though. She's walking around almost like she's searching for something. I was thinking she might come and have a drink. But what a fantastic surprise. Good morning, my name is Byron and on camera this morning is Brian with me and the thumb. And then we have Jamie and Jandre on the other vehicle and then of course Jerry and Rebecca in the final control. Now this is such a great start. I was hoping to find Karula with the youngsters. That's what I came looking for this morning. And uh, fortunately we've managed to bump into the young female. Now let's see if she does drink. That's a beautiful view of her. This is really, really a great treat. And don't forget everyone, we are completely live. So send us your questions and your comments uh, either on Twitter at hashtag Safari Live or email us questions at wildearth.tv. And we'll gladly answer your questions and your comments. It's always great hearing from our viewers. Now, this is very, very special. I'm so happy to see her. Now, I wonder if the female has walked through here, the adult female, Karula. Um, all right, let me try reposition for us quickly. Oh, dear. Uh, Liz, thank you very much. Um, maybe a little bit of luck, who knows. There we go. Oh. Let's see. I always want to try and get a view of a leopard drinking, and especially photographers. Let's see, she seems a little bit cautious, almost like she's not too sure where she should be drinking. I'm still just scanning this area very carefully to see if the female isn't around. Karula. Um, or perhaps the other young cub, Hosanna. She is drinking. Now, that is wonderful. Now, you see, she's very, she's still nervous. You can see, typical young cub. She's not too sure what's in the water hole. There might be one or two little terrapins in there that are moving, and maybe she's a little nervous of the movement in the water. You know what, I can hear a Frank or a few Franklins alarm calling just off to our left, um, so directly behind Shongile, down in the drainage line in the Mulwati. And I wouldn't be surprised if maybe one or two of the other leopards are down there. And I will go have a look, but this is just such a lovely view. I'm going to see if I can't maybe reposition quickly. I'll tell you why, usually leopards, if they do drink, they do drink for a while. Um, she may be a little bit different. Let me just see. Bear with me for a second. All right, let's, while I get into position now, let's quickly head to Jamie and let her say good morning to you. Very good morning to all of you and welcome on the Sunrise Safari, although I have to I have to confess, I think your chances of a spectacular sunrise this morning are slim. 
is beautiful weather, uh, but it's not really conducive to spectacular red, gold and orange sun sunrises on this beautiful morning. Now, my name is Jamie and this morning I have Jandre on camera with me. And it seems as though it's quite a gloomy morning, although off to a fantastic start with Byron and that gorgeous leopard cub. She really is too adorable for words, that little one. She's developed quite the character. And looks as though, I'm going to stop for a second so that you can let me attempt to get the antenna out of the way. Looks as though the rain is bucketing down over the Drakensberg Mountains, so much so that you actually can't see the Drakensberg Mountains. So somewhere across to the western edge of our area, the rain is pouring down. I wish they'd send a little bit our way. That would be very convenient. However, not all things are not working out in our favour. This morning, Byron is still with that leopard cub and we don't want to miss a moment. So off you pop to him and I'll see you soon. Well, she's still sitting in front of the little water hole, the little pan. <laughs> this is such a nice surprise. It is so great to end your mornings start like this. It looks like that little dry spell that I had <laughs> the other day is, is finished, which is nice. Oh, this little female is just wonderful. Um, I was watching the footage that James got the other day, James and Jandre, um, with this female up in the tree and how curious she was. And that is just an incredible experience. Such a such an amazing uh, bit of interaction from a young leopard and I have I have um, seen it before where young leopards are a bit curious and we do still need to be careful but um, but it just shows you know with, with us being out here and being respectful of the animals and taking our time tracking following them and occasionally the young animals do get quite curious and they will come have a look and see what or investigate rather but um, but that was just an incredible sighting that he had and this too just to see her exploring um, it is wonderful This is so great. This really is so great. And it's, I really do enjoy seeing leopards at this age because, uh, as I said, it's this exploring stage where the female will potentially leave her, her cubs for a little bit longer, longer periods of time and um and when she does that she'll they'll they'll explore they'll move around a little bit more than usual they'll go and have a look what is around just like shungile is doing now uh, having a look around this mud wallow it's almost like she's coming to pose for us, so close to us. This is maybe a nice view of spot patterns. Those of you who would like to get a look at a spot pattern, she appears to be a 4-3 from what I can see. One, two, three, four on the left. And then, well, as I'm looking at her, four on a, on on the left, so it would be the four on her right hand side of her face, and then the three spots on the other side, just above that whisker line. That's usually how we do identify leopards, it's by the spot pattern, so she appears to be a 4-3, because each of those spots are unique, and especially those three, those four on this side are very clear, you can see one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, and then that fourth one just a little bit above the smaller spot. So, it 
Capriel Norton, you're a new viewer and welcome to you. Lovely to have you on Safari Live. And you wanted to know, is it usual for a leopard to go to a waterhole by itself? Well, yes, it is, because leopards are generally solitary animals. So they move around by themselves. And um, the reason why I'm surprised to see this female by herself is um, and exploring a waterhole water hole by herself is because she's still young and um, she does rely a lot on the on the mother the female um, who still provides food for her but but it's not unusual to see a leopard at a water hole by itself not by any stretch of imagination they are solitary animals and when they do move around it's by themselves and they'll go and drink by themselves but i've got a i've got a feeling that either the, the adult female or the young male who is her brother um, is around in this area uh, just because I heard some uh, Franklin alarm calling in the drainage lines and she came out of that area so I wouldn't be surprised if they're down there somewhere um, perhaps perhaps the female has moved off trying to hunt and she's left these two youngsters in this area Who knows? <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. And as Franklin's calling again, um, uh, Michelle, you wanted to know what age would we expect to see Shongile make her first kill? So she's still, she's still very young um, and for the moment she would try and hunt perhaps squirrels as we saw them try to do the other day. Her and her young brother hunted a squirrel, maybe a Franklin or two. Um, so they'd be learning at this age but, um, but not old enough and not big enough to really hunt anything large yet or any, um, any antelope just yet. I would say on average, Michelle, it's probably about from about just over a year. Um, so anywhere between a year and three months to a year and a half, then they would have to start hunting for themselves. And that's usually the age that leopard cubs become independent, where the females do tend to chase them off. The average age is about a year and a half. So by that stage, they would have to they would have to uh, be able to hunt for themselves. But I think these little cubs are just a little bit too young still. But they'll be learning, perhaps learning from the female, trying to watch her. This is lovely. There's uh, birds calling in the distance. Cape turtle doves this morning calling. There is a, a grey headed bush shrike in the distance. Let's see what she does. It's almost like she's just coming to have a look, exploring, wondering what is around this waterhole. Is and she keeps having a look at us. <laughs> I wonder if she wants us to, it's almost like she's just so comfortable with us being around that she's just checking that we, if we see anything perhaps of interest that we could show her. And typical cub behavior, little restless, moving around quite a bit. And also we're so fortunate, it's nice and cool at the moment. So she'll probably be a lot more active than she usually is. Um, moving about, having a look, let's see where she goes. But I wonder where the others are. It would be wonderful if all three of them were out here drinking at the water hole. That would be really amazing.
Rob, I don't think this cub is nervous. Um, and, well, to an extent. Um, I think she's cautious because she's alone. Um, she, she's just, she's learning. That's it. She's by herself. Um, for, for the first few months of her life, the two young cubs would be left together. And we've seen lately, the last week or so, the young male has wandered off quite a bit by himself. We saw him yesterday afternoon. And now the young female's wandering off a little bit by herself. So this is all a learning process. So I wouldn't say they're nervous. And I mean, for her to lie down like that, she's definitely not nervous. If a leopard was nervous, it would run away and try and hide from anything. I think she's just cautious and learning. She's having a look around what is what is around here. Um, and, and as I said, because they're so curious, they're looking, perhaps she's looking for some food. What, uh, what is around that she could potentially play with or try and hunt and learn, learn how to hunt. So, you know, I don't think it's a case of her looking nervous at all. Um, it's just very inquisitive, constantly looking around, seeing what is, what is moving around her, that's all. Um, Michael, it's not really instinctual for, for young cubs just to move off away from the females. Um, you wanted to know how will they move off or how will they know. So usually the female just tells them. She will, she will hiss and growl a bit at them and she basically chases them away. That's usually how it happens. However, some females are a little bit more tolerant than others. I've seen some females allow their cubs to hang around for up to two years, which is, un which is unusual. Um, but then I've also seen a female leave her cub and chase her cub away at a year old. So it does vary, depends on the leopard. Um, but the females are the ones that generally s warn the cubs. They hiss, they growl, and they usually don't go back and fetch them. So. Some arrow marked babblers calling in the distance. We can hear. Um, Maria, you wanted to know why don't we see the male leopard as much? Now, Maria, I'd, I'd, are you referring to the young male cub or males in general? Um, I think one of the main reasons would be the last few days, the big males, the big dominant males, their territories are much larger than females. So they're possibly just patrolling territories and maybe have a kill somewhere and we just haven't seen them for a while. We saw Tingana not too long ago, I think three or four days ago. He is the big dominant male that patrols this area generally. There are other males around and they do come in to the area occasionally, but because males are so territorial, they don't really cross over into each other's territory. And, uh, and for this area, we've got about three or four different females that we see on a fairly regular basis. There was Shadow yesterday, 
and there was Karula. Um, this little one was seen, and then um, obviously the young male was seen, her brother. But he's a young male, not territorial yet at all, obviously. He's still hanging around with the mother. But I think it's purely because in terms of territory size, males are bigger, females are smaller, so you might get more females in a smaller area, whereas you'd probably only have one male moving around. That's a lovely yawn. cleaning herself and big cats do this quite regularly do clean themselves especially leopards especially after they've fed on something and uh, yesterday the the female did go and fetch these cubs and bring them all the way down here they were not in this area um, yesterday morning they were quite far from here a few miles away but the female went and fetched them she did have a kill so they possibly fed a little bit last night or yesterday and um, maybe still just cleaning herself. Now, Roger, um, the leopards, they, they, they do call when they are looking for one another at, at, at times, but, but uh, you must remember, Roger, leopards generally, I mean, they're solitary animals, so they don't usually call um, to look or find one another, look for one another or find one, one another. They will call for territorial purposes to warn other leopards that this is their territory. This young female wouldn't necessarily call because I think she's been left here on purpose by the fee by the mother so she knows just to keep quiet she doesn't want to draw attention to herself either if she constantly called other predators like hyena or lions if they were around might come and investigate she doesn't want to draw attention to herself so um, so no I don't I don't think there's any reason for her to call and she'll just wait, hang around here, and wait for the female to come back. We were just fortunate that she came out and we found her. Um, but generally speaking, the, when, they, when they are left on their own, then they'll stay on their own and just wait for the female to return. So there's no reason for her to call now. They do give a, the females, when they come back to find the cubs, she will give a little call. And it's, it is, it's like a little ow, ow, ow to try and try and call the cubs and and uh, they'll then know it's her and they'll come running out and find her um, but uh, but for the cubs to call the female only when she gets there she, they won't call unnecessarily all right well what an incredible start I'm gonna sit here a little bit longer because this is such a wonderful sighting but Jamie has found some other big cats to show you Aha! What a fantastic start to a Tuesday morning. From seeing their tracks coming out of Simbombili to finding the lions on their buffalo kill right next to a dam called, or a waterhole called Sydney's Dam, which is in Buffalo's Hook, we have our wonderful Nkuhumas. It's so special to see them because, of course, yesterday I was hearing all sorts of updates about them and they were stretching and yawning and going for a walk and having a drink at Simbambili Dam and we couldn't get to them. So to see our much-beloved Pride of Lions is always a very special thing indeed. Unfortunately, though, because it is on Buffles Hook, which is a property to the north of our boundary, unfortunately we can't go any closer. 
so I can't really improve the view that we have. However, it is always special to catch up, especially on such an atmospheric morning. Here's one little straggler. What you up to, little monkey? Go eat your breakfast. <laughs> Watching the rest of the pride as they slowly but surely move towards Sydney's dam. And I wonder if they're going to go and have a drink. I don't know, Genre, can you see those ones on the, on the, yes, you can. Perfect, thank you. One lioness, two lionesses. I actually think that this kill was relatively recent, at least in the last three or four hours that these lionesses took down this buffalo. There was still a little bit of growling, a little bit of fussing over who had a chance to eat first. And now the lionesses are looking, I can't see, but you see, ah, there we go. I was about to say, you see that hunched posture of the lioness, she might be watching something, but she's up now. And I'm hoping and while we watch these lions and at Sydney's dam itself, or Sydney's waterhole, I'm hoping that you really might get to hear one of the most impressive sounds. What are you ladies looking at of the bush? And that is the call of the African fish eagle. And we'll go into that in a moment, but I just want to, I actually think I want to go forward. I'm a little bit concerned about losing signal as we go forward into the dip, but I do want to, Oops. <laughs> Sorry, I was speaking over the African fish eagle's call. <laughs> okay. Well, it seems as though it's actually the lionesses have relaxed. There's some arguing over the remains of the buffalo. <laughs> Chandra, I've just realized. Remember when I said the guinea fowl are making a fuss about nothing? They're not obviously making a fuss about nothing because obviously they've been watching these lions and alarm calling at them. I always find it astounding how... I shouldn't find it astounding the number of times I've seen it, but just the aggression between the females, and it's all forgotten. And welcome to BHJ Horses on this sunrise safari. He wanted to know how long the pride will be feeding on this... Hold on, go back. It's, mm, minor scrap. Little bit of growling between them. Sorry, horses. I'm, I'm going to... Um, shorten your, your name to horses, I hope you don't mind. Or perhaps BHJ. Um, either way, you want to know how long this carcass will last them? Not long at all. Uh, so there are five lionesses in this pride, at least as far as I can see at the moment. There are, there are five lionesses, there might not be five lionesses at the moment. There might also be a male somewhere in the vicinity, but I doubt it, just because of the fact that the lionesses are feeding now, and all looking relatively full. So I don't think there's a male, but there are five lionesses and six cubs, which is a lot of bellies to feed. Even though the cubs are just a few months old, the oldest are coming up to six months or just six months. Uh, the youngest are around four. Um, and despite the fact that they are still young, they are hungry little creatures. And as a result, this carcass won't last long at all. At all. It's not a big buffalo. It looks like it is either a young male or a female from what little I can see. The Yukum is proving once again that they are a force to be reckoned with. This is the second time I've found the Yukumas really, really easily in the last week. <coughs> I'm going to have to start paying for it. I feel as though somehow Bush Karma is going to come back and bite me. Ah. Here comes James. And our special guests. So James is driving out of Voyatella Lodge, which means that he can cruise along towards the lions and come a little bit closer. So when you see a vehicle getting closer and you're wondering about why it is that we can't go there, it's just traverse agreements. It's just different traverse agreements. Ah, the excitement. And the lioness watching them. So there you go. 
Now typically, we, we have seen the Nkumas in the past with their buffalo kill, to go back to how long it will take them to finish it off. We've seen Nkumas in the past with buffalo kills, big buffalo bulls that have lasted them a good two or three, sometimes even four or five days, depending on how many lionesses are there. I love that possessive paw, just by the way, it's, it's mine, I want it. But now things have drastically changed with the arrival of the cubs, even though they are quite young and quite small. Fortunately for them, their moms and aunts are very proficient hunters. And they seem to have, I wouldn't call it an unparalleled success rate, but it is certainly an extraordinary success rate when it comes to catching and killing buffalo over the last few weeks. A little cub back there, ears back, already showing the signs of aggression that we've seen as they, the cubs have grown older, they, at such a tender age, know that they have to fight for their place at the table. And fortunately, they know that usually, usually, mind you, that mom or aunt is probably not going to hurt too much if they do get into a fight about whose chance it is to feed. Now, Red, you say, so is it only these two lionesses? No, Red, it is, there are definitely four. Um, so remember how we saw the two lionesses looking towards the water hole, and I said, oh, they might have, they might have seen something. They're definitely two lionesses. Um, I'm not sure if they, there could actually be three um, across the other side of the vegetation where James is, and I'll ask him in a moment. Now, it could, it's, it's either four or five. There's definitely four. So one of them is lying there. The second lioness moved off a little bit and you can see James and the rest of the crew watching in that direction. So she might have gone to have a drink. Now absolutely there are more than two lionesses. As for cubs, it's been a bit tricky to do a head count just in terms of the distance that we have to keep. Uh, unfortunately, we can't go any closer, so I can't do a head count, but since James is very conveniently driving a vehicle that can drive there, we'll find out shortly. And Schlack, you want to know where the dominant male is. Well, here's the fascinating thing about lion prides and the way in which they work. Uh, the movies like The Lion King and sort of traditional documentaries have taught us um, and obviously documentaries have changed in their style, but traditional documentaries have taught us that there is a pride of lions and the pride of lions has one or two or three males that heads them up. That's actually not exactly how prides work. A pride is just females and their offspring. And they move about in their own territory and that will border on the territory of another pride and another pride and so on. And then what happens is we get either a single male or a group of males known as a coalition. And a coalition of males will have a very large territory that will actually overlap with that of several different prides that they will be dominant over. And what that means, oh, I don't know if any of you saw the Swainson spur file there. That's a bird that we don't often get to see. Sorry, distraction. Look at it with its red face. Swainson's spur fowl for, your, for all of you with your budding bird lists. Sorry, I'll go back into lion dynamics in a moment, but that is a an opportunity not to be missed. Well done, Jandre. Swainson's, S-W-A-I-N-S-O-N-S, -S -S, Swainson's Spurfowl. Related to the Franklins, of course. Uh, right, so dominant males will have a very, very large territory. Sometimes they're with the prides, um, whether they are mating with the females or sharing their kills, and sharing is a very, very strong use of the word sharing. Uh, usually dominating their kills is perhaps more accurate. Um, but a lot of the time they're off either on their own or in groups, um, busy defending their territory or, or just moving about on their own. So in this area, our dominant males are known as the Birmingham boys, and there's four of them. As to where they are now, I can't tell you. They'll be somewhere, somewhere, but they've got a good 8,000, at least an 8,000 hectare territory, if not larger. So they're not always with the females. I think that is a fact for which the females are occasionally grateful, just because for them, it means that they get to enjoy the carcass un <laughs> unchallenged. But the males do play a very important role, and they'll be traveling and moving about, particularly at night, 
defending their territory. And the fact that they do so is very, it's, it's crucial to particularly the survival of these little cubs that you're seeing. Because the minute that those boys disappear, the minute that they lose their grip on their territory, their cubs that they have fathered will be killed by incoming new males, which is all part of, it sounds harsh, it's all part of the natural cycle of um, lions and making sure that there's no inbreeding. But the, the male lions do form a very, very crucial part. It's not a hands-on part of the cubs' lives, but it is an absolutely essential part. Welcome to DH, BHJ Horses. Should I call you Horses or shall I call you BHJ? Which, which one would you prefer? Because at some point I'm going to get that wrong. DHJ. Oh well, I'd better get it right then if I'm going to shorten your name. Apologies. Very good morning to you once again. Um, I've completely forgotten your question now. We were talking about lions. Oh yes, I remember. Thank you very much, Andre. Thank you very much. <laughs> you wanted to know if lions chuff like tigers. No, they don't. Um, tigers are actually the only creatures that chuff, and it's a sort of a... I, I, I can't quite imitate the tiger chuff that they do. Um, the, probably the only animal that comes close-ish to a tiger chuff out here is maybe a leopard. Um, when they call for their cubs, and that's a sort of a ow, ow sound that they make. Lions don't chuff, they do roar, which puts them as part of the same family as the tigers and the leopards. It's, it's the panthera family, that ability to roid, to roid, to roar, <laughs> which <laughs> occurs in the hyoid suspensorium, so the, the voice box, which in human beings is, is a solid fused organ whereas in lions and in leopards and in tigers, all of the cats that make a roaring sound, it is not fused, so it can expand. It's called the suspensorium. Um, leopards come close. Lions do contact call, and we've been fortunate enough to watch these lovely ladies with their cubs over the last few months, and you get this amazing sort of ow, ow sound from the cubs. Not that sound, that's different. That's a different thing altogether. That's just angry. And then you do get the low contact calls of the lionesses, which sort of sound a bit like this. So those, those are the, the general sounds that you'll hear. Cheetah also have a wide, wide variety of sounds that they make. They do not roar, which is one of the reasons why they are in a separate, separate genus from the panthera cats. So the lions and the leopards and the tigers. They chirp and they purr and no, they don't really chuff. I was gonna, it's a stretch to say that they chuff. They sort of go as a contact call between the moms and cubs. So there you go, the wide vocal variety of our different cats, as done by Jamie. Um, disclaimer, I don't claim to be an expert at imitating the cats. Although I think my, I think my lion cub impression is, is I've got it down. Ah, Jerry has given me, Jerry in Final Control, who is directing this morning's show, she has given me an 8 out of 10 for my animal impressions. I think I lost points on that cheetah call. That cheetah call was a bit poor. I, th I feel as though my leopard contact call with cubs was pretty good, and I feel as though my cub contact call, lion cub contact call, was pretty good. Yeah. Jerry says leopard was good. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to even attempt to do a lion growl or a lion roar. I know my limits. Bear with me one moment, I would just like to contact Mr. Hendry, provided he's listening to his radio. James, James. Yay! Uh, do you know if there are four or five lionesses?
Copy, copy, thank you. James says he thinks they're five, he thinks he's counted five. They are sort of m moving about, so it's difficult to keep track, but it does seem as though there are five lionesses. So all five of our lovely Inkahuma ladies are here and are present. So all of the essential parts, not essential parts, that's a very poor way of phrasing it, my apologies. All of the, the best parts of the buffalo kill are gone. The very first thing that almost all predators will eat when they catch something is the organs. Things like the liver, the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, all of those of course have an incredible amount of nutrients. Whether they are acting as a storage unit or for whatever reason they are very very nutrient rich. So the, the parts of the, the animal that are most in demand will be the organs. And you can see that we're just we're looking into the chest cavity of this buffalo. All of the organs are gone already, and it might have been that this kill is, I would suggest, is a few hours old. At first I thought it was fresh, just judging by the sounds that I could hear, but I actually think it's a few hours old. It's always brrrr. Yes, I hear you. And welcome to Gary, who would like to know what all of the insects are that are flying around the buffalo. They're carcass flies. So you said they look rather large. They are rather large. They're, they're probably about that big. Um, and it's something that as you become more familiar with our live safaris, Gary, and, and, and as we get, obviously when, when the kills are on an air, or in an area where we can go a little bit closer, you'll find that we're often plagued by the carcass flies that buzz around the carcasses. They'll actually come and sit around us, we'll, we'll wa be waving our hands around like we're doing some kind of bizarre fly dance. They are carcass flies, big bottle green flies with red heads. So that's what's buzzing around um, in next to no time, as in, in the next 24 hours, this carcass will be teeming with maggots that will then of course go about completing their life cycle in terms of growing and as I'm sure many of you know maggots their growth rate depends very much on the temperature that they are exposed to so on a chilly morning like this morning and forgive me off the top of my head I can't remember what how warm it was or how cool it was I have a vague feeling it was low 20s 21 ish mm -hmm. it was there we go genre says yes 21 degrees centigrade which is 71 in Fahrenheit. So yes, it's, it's a nippy-ish morning for us here in the middle of summer with the clouds. So the growth rate of the maggots might be slightly slower, but we will continue to see flies buzzing around that carcass for at least another 24 hours, if not longer. And after that will come the ticks and the carrion beetles. And just by the way, um, car speaking of carrion beetles, I don't know if any of you were watching the bushwalk that we did a few days ago, where we were sitting at a civetry, which is a, a type, it's, a, it's basically a midden that a certain type of animal leaves. Um, but the beetles that we were looking at were in fact carrion beetles. I double checked, I had a feeling that they were, but they were in fact carrion beetles, not they, they're sort of part of, they, they're connected to the, the dung beetle family, but only in a very vague way. So they were carrion beetles. <laughs> the little face of that cub. You can see the female utilizing her claws there to hold the buffalo down as she tucks in. Now meal times for our new viewers, meal times with lions are always like this. There is always lots of growling and even with the cubs involved, um, often the cubs find themselves at the receiving end of a swat from mom or aunt's massive paws. So meal times are, it's, it's basically every lion for themselves, even for the little cubs. There's very little altruistic about lions at the dinner table. Oh. Yes, little one. Sorry, Linus. I don't know if she heard me. There, she's calling. Whoops. I actually think she did hear me. I didn't mean to, but I actually think she did hear me call. 
not this lioness, but the one that was at the kill. Um, as I did the little owl sound of the cub, which I'm going to cease from doing, I'm not sure if I'm really overestimating my ability to to do lion cub calls, but she immediately looked up and started contact calling. I'm, I'm not sure. She it's definitely her reaction was almost instantaneous. It's the one with her head up, Chandre. As soon as I did that cub call, she looked across at me and then started doing the low lioness contact call. Oops, sorry, girl. Sorry, sorry. That was totally unintentional if, if you did actually respond to me. I might be wrong. She might just be calling her cubs. But it did feel as though I accidentally... accidentally sounded too much like a cub. Look at that little cub at the back hissing. <laughs> Cheeky monster. Stop hissing and eat, then. Your, your mom's not doing anything to stop you. Ooh. <laughs> angry, angry little lion cubs. Just like your pet cats or your pet dogs at home, or your pet horses, actually. Um, if you if you familiar with animals at all, you'll immediately know that that ears back posture tells you a great deal about the animal's mood. And the same thing applies to lions. When they're cross, when they're aggressive, they will have their ears flat back like that. It's a, it's it's an aggressive defensive pose, if that makes any sense. That ears back at the kill. They're saying this is my patch, but at the same time, they they are patiently waiting to be on the receiving end of a, the odd blow. <laughs> we just sit here for a little bit longer as the lions squabble over their breakfast. <coughs> Excuse me. However, in the meantime, there is somebody who would very much like to say good morning to you, so let's head over to Steph. Good morning and welcome to the bushwalk segment of this morning Sunrise Safari. I'm Steph Winterbull and today on camera we have Viam. And what are we up to today? Well, it's actually quite a tough question today to tell you quite honest. The wind is busy blowing out of the southwest, which is unusual. Either we get wind from the south or southeast or we get wind from the north. So today with wind blowing out of the southwest, it becomes a little bit tricky as to decide what to do. Generally, we get quite big rains that come with that and as you can see a band of clouds there on the horizon is very dark over the escarpment the great Drakensberg mountains it forms a ridge of mountains basically stretching from the Cape right down in the southern point of South Africa right up to about that point where they disappear into another mountain range called the Soltpansberg or the Saltpan Mountains. A beautiful range of mountains where we live over here that we can see. But what it does do is it pushes up a whole bunch of moisture that we get from the Mozambique Channel and the Indian Ocean. South Africa is flanked by the Atlantic Ocean on the western side and the Indian Ocean on the eastern side. And in summertime, a lot of moist air gets sucked off of the sea and pushed inland. And they bunch up against the mountains that we've got in the distance over there, probably about 80 to 90 miles from where we're standing right now. And it lifts that moisture up into the sky and the moisture condenses into clouds. And then we get these fluffy, puffy clouds that we can see over here. They can sometimes stick around for a few days, giving us a lot of rain. How does that influence our walk? Well, we're obviously not going to be trying to walk a marathon today. We're going to be trying to stay somewhere where if it does start raining, we can get you back to the tent rather safely. But while we're about it, why don't we take a walk across quarantine and see what we've got on these massive clearings. This is quite easily the largest clearing at Juma. And I must be honest with you, they have got almost always something happening on these planes. But while we decide what is here today, I've noted to show you, why don't we send you over to Byron, who's got a little surprise for you. And look what we have managed to find, everyone. This is a first for me. Hardy dart chicks. 
Look at the female feeding the little chicks. I've never, I don't think I've ever seen a hardy doll in a nest. Never mind these little chicks. There are three chicks in there. Uh, we spotted them. I've just driven around this drainage line having a look to see if I can't find any of the other leopards if the the female Karula or the young male Hosana is in the area, but uh, no sign of them just yet Isn't this amazing? This is so special. This is something very very different. Wow. I must be honest, it looks like the one chick is getting more food than the others. Wow, that looks like a lot of hard work for the, for the female. Feeding these three very, very hungry chicks. The one at the back doesn't look like it's getting any food. Isn't that incredible? I'm sure that's a first for a lot of you too. I don't think anyone, I, I don't know anyone who's seen hardy dart chicks like this. Brian, you've never seen it before, have yeah, you? Yeah, it's the first time well. yeah, that's very, very cool, exciting. Just shows you never know what you're going to find out here. <laughs> well, that was a very interesting find and a nice surprise. Ariel, you say this is awesome. You've never seen this before. Yeah, I mean, you know, this, it's always wonderful seeing chicks um, because usually birds are very secretive with their chicks and are well hidden. <laughs> Look at these, these hardy does. No feathers, just little, little bundles of fluff, really. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Red, you want to know if the female, if I think the female feels any discomfort while regurgitating food? No, I don't think so at all. It's it's natural for them. They regurgitate food to feed their chicks. That's that's what they do. So I don't think it's discomfort at all. You can hear orange-breasted bushrike calling and a red-chested cuckoo in the distance. A lot of birds calling at the moment. Zach, um, you're a new viewer. Welcome, Zach. Great to have you on Safari Live. Now, you'd like to know how big those birds are. So, the hardy daw is a fairly large bird, um, the hardy daw ibis. And the best is if I, if I show you in front of me, the hardy daw, as it stands, would probably be, probably be about that big as it stands next to me, maybe a little bit bigger. They've got fairly long legs. That's how big our hardy dog would be. I'd say those chicks are about that size, by the looks of things. About that size. So fairly small. There's that red chested cuckoo calling. It's 
somewhere around here. All right. Well, shall we leave the chicks to enjoy their breakfast? It looks like they might even be finished now. Uh, well, that was wonderful for the hardy dart to show us her chicks. Lovely sighting, something very unique and different. That was great. <laughs> DHJ horses, you're a new viewer, welcome. You want to know if there's a pecking order with these chicks, if one is more dominant and feeds. So I don't know with Hardy Dart. I've never, like I said, I've never seen Hardy Dart chicks. By the looks of things with them feeding, yes, there is a pecking order because one seemed to get a lot more food than the others. But um, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but generally with birds, there is often a pecking order. One does tend to be a little bit more dominant and gets a bit more food. And some pecking orders are, are so great that, uh, that the one chick may kill the other chick so that it gets all the food. That does happen with certain, <coughs> excuse me, certain species of birds. Now, can you believe it, but our young female leopard has disappeared. Where has she gone? I did a quick little loop. She was lying right over there. And she's gone. All right, well, let me try and have a look around here. While we do that, let's head back to Steph, who is on the bushwalk. And we've got a bit of a mystery going on over here. This is very obviously hippo dung. And why I say obviously is that hippo, being closer related to whales and manatees than they are to elephants and rhinoceros, they don't have any exocrine glands. So they don't have any glands on their skin that they can use to mark territory. And so what a hippo does is he utilizes his urine and his feces as signposts, um, much the same as an animal would use a gland on their face or a gland on their feet or a gland situated underneath their tail. Hippos only have the use of their their dung and their feces and they use it to great effect. The hippo's got this big flat tail, probably about this big. They'll reverse up to a bush and they'll start to defecate and flap their, t their, p their tail. They wave it around furiously at the same time defecating and it sprays their dung over quite an enormous area. So part of the dung is here. I'll take two big steps and you'll see how far it can actually spray. So that does two big steps, easily about 12 feet or so, spread across. And the hippo would have been standing facing in this direction. He would have marked his territory, and then as he moved off, he's been dribbling some fluid, which is a bit of a worry. You can see here, yeah, there's some fluid that's come out here. This is not urine because of its greenish color. As you can see, that's definitely fluid stained by vegetable matter. It then drips everywhere on the floor here. To here, another patch comes out here, drips on the floor, and more some more here, and more drips down here. And if you look up down the road, you can see for quite some time, this hippo has had some, basically some fluid falling out of him. Now, a runny tummy in animals is, is obviously never a good sign. A runny tummy in animals shows that their digestive system or their digestive tract has an infection of some sort. As far as I understand it, I'm obviously not a veterinarian, so I'm not too sure exactly why this would be. I only know that rhinoceros suffer from it, elephants suffer from it, warthogs suffer from it, and of course hippo do suffer from these maladies every now and again, probably brought on by the vegetation that they're eating. There's still not a lot of vegetation for an animal the size of a hippopotamus to have as much food of a good quality that he's needing. You can see that although there's some grass out there and it's greening up so beautifully that for an animal the size of a hippo there's definitely not 
too much. And what I think has happened is this hippo has gone and eaten a plant that contains some or other type of uh, compound that has upset its tummy. And now it's walked off. And I have a feeling it's heading off in the same direction as Treehouse Dam is located in. Treehouse Dam is where you can see that big green tree on the hill. It lies between that green tree and left where the basically the trees cut out the, the roads. It lies just inside there, not too far away from here. And I think that that is where this hippo is making its way to. It wouldn't be a bad idea and see if he got there, see what he's been up to. So we'll head out to Treehouse Dam. That's the plan now anyway. And we'll see why has this hippo got such a runny tummy. Let's see if, how often he defecates over here. All right, let's carry on going. See what we can find today else for you. This mystery that is this hippo's runny tummy. Shame, I feel quite sorry for it. Never nice to be sick out here, you know. Now, you might be asking yourself the question, would we do something for this hippo? Um, only if this particular hippo's sickness had something to do with people. So if, it, if there was an uh, anthropogenic or a people uh, cause to this particular um, malady, ate a piece of plastic or, you know, something like this, got into a food store somewhere. In this particular case, this is 100% natural. Most of the time, hippo actually get over this pretty easily. I remember a couple of years ago, I was doing some research on uh, the diseases that elephant and rhinoceros and hippopotamus and giraffe get and it was remarkable to me that hippo caught half the diseases of the terrestrial animals. So half, the, the, the hippo's list of diseases was half that of even an elephant. So in general I think they're quite hardy animals and so there's no need for concern over here over this young hippo. I think you'll be just fine as soon as the vegetation repairs itself. Now Dale, you've asked me where do these hippo go uh, with the lack of water run. Dale, luckily in this part of the Kruger National Park where we are situated on the western side, there's a lot of pumped pans. There are also a lot of pans that have been man-made. In other words, uh, creeks have been dammed up to hold water into the dry season or hold water for longer into the dry season. And so there's always a puddle or two out here um, that, uh, th that hippo, like this particular hippo, have access to. So not to worry, there's enough water out here for these hippos. It's not always very deep, it's not always very pleasant, but there's definitely enough water. Different case on the eastern side of the Kruger National Park. On the eastern side, there's very few man-made dams and pans, and this year I've heard that over a thousand hippopotamus succumbed to the drought, and that there's just bones bleaching, or lying bleaching in the sun uh, in fields. I still have yet to go and see it myself. These fields of bones, as some of my colleagues are referring to it, I look forward to seeing that, not in a, in a gleeful way, it's going to be a macabre sighting, just to realize the depth that this drought that we've had has had uh, and the the effect it's had on the animals but one of the things that didn't seem to be too affected by animals whatsoever was this species of ant this ant I only started to observe this particular year I haven't observed this ant at, at another time and I like to call it a cement ant not because that's its real name but because it has this peculiar habit of cementing the entrance to their burrows with a substance that is crystalline almost in its in its hardness it's much much more resistant to um, to erosion than the rest of the surrounding sand so here you can see just with me rubbing I can rub away the sand fairly easily but here you can see how resistant that crystalline is and what it is, it's nothing less than a miracle. These ants are part of an order of insects called Hymenoptera, which are the some of the most evolved organisms on the planet. Not sentient, um, as far as what we can tell, <laughs> but definitely highly evolved. And this cementing of the entrance burrow is simply to stop water from eroding the entrance burrow and blocking their tunnels inside with eroded sand material. So water will come along, would move around and erode around the entrances to these burrows, 
leaving these slightly raised and a little bit resistant to the water's mechanizations and then it moves off around and away. Isn't that incredible? You can see over here in actual fact, it looks like they're building, just moving slow. They'll get up to speed as the day goes on. These are not very fast moving ants. They, for me, have a very bulbous head, quite short stubby mandibles, quite often on the predaceous, ah oh, there we go, there's a winged, an ant that is reproductive. Most ants in a colony are females, most of them are also sterile, but these ones that come out with the wings are the, the new kings and queens of this ant colony. So what you're having a look at there, which is the first time I'm seeing it, is the new king or queen for one of these cement ant colonies. And that cement ant, remember, is in Hafens. Wonderful. I love watching these things. These particular ants don't have any grain stores yet, and it's because there hasn't been a lot of seeds around at the moment. I did notice towards the end of last year that they had these, where they'd discarded, they have these refuse dumps where they discard the empty husks of the grass seeds that they've taken down underground. And I have at times, actually I lie, here we go. Here's their refuse dump right here. So this discolored piece of sand that you're seeing over here, that is their refuse dump. Let's see if we can find one that comes and utilizes it. Generally these ants are busy doing something almost all the time. You could find them doing something almost anywhere. And on the fringes of these ants are usually the highly specialized predators that will utilize ant colonies for whatever. It's generally speaking food. The ants have larvae that are underground. They are looked after. They are normally white and encased in either, a, uh, sorry, they have not larvae, they've got pupa that are either encased in a white casing uh, or held in an enclosed, uh, basically like a comb, uh, very similar to honey. And or honeycomb, and they're just a little bit underground over here, and there are a lot of predators that go into these ant nests, mimicking the smells of these ants, preying on the baby ants, and on the adults. Here's another winged alate coming out here. Another future king and queen. Look there, and this one's even carrying a rock. What are you doing? That is the most bizarre thing. And why that is, is because ants are castes. They are born to perform a specific function. And for this ant, which is basically the new king or queen to be dragging around a rock this size. It would be similar to, I don't know, a, a king or queen taking out their own dustbin bag or sweeping their own driveway. It's just something very, very different to see. And I wonder why they're doing that. That is very bizarre. I say, you learn something new out here every single day, to be honest. I've been doing this now close on 18 years, and every single day you see something new. What's going on here? Who knows? But anyway, I think I can only probably keep you entertained on ants for so long. And uh, the days are wasting. There's one coming with some refuse that they're going to dump. And you can see that ant basically took out this piece of refuse, dumped it onto the refuse dump, and then is now moving back to their hole. Absolutely incredible. I love these little things. Still haven't figured out what these ants are. I've sent them away to a couple of friends of mine, but I think that we're only noticing these ants this year because of the fact that uh, it's so dry and there's so little cover around that what's happening is there's gaps in the vegetation that is busy opening and we for the first time are observing, are observing this. And for the first time I noticed this white, this white uh, calcrete that they produce around the entrance to their burrows and then I've been able to notice these ants and so now I pick up these ants all over the place. They're fairly common ants out here but not described in any book that I have or any book that any of my friends have got that are in the industry as well. So we're waiting for an epiphany here, for someone to help enlighten us.
Now, Jeffrey, all the way from Texas, I agree with you. I also love watching ants. They are always doing something, Jeffrey says. And they absolutely are. They definitely don't lie down and rest, that's for sure. They do have, it's interesting, they do have different periods of the day that they'll do different things in. Um, for instance, there's an ant here called a cocktail ant that runs around with its tail cocked up in the air like this. And in the middle of the day, they are hunting furiously. At the beginning and at the end of every day, they are doing a housekeeping they keep their their nests clean and it's just always such an exciting thing to see the way that they change behavior through the day and when they're hunting you can't get close to these ants they're just swarming everywhere when they're busy building their their nest they come in and out at the most amazing speed um, and you can sit right close to them you can watch them doing their thing and they hardly ever uh, they hardly ever you know don't uh, they don't move off in other words these particular ants they don't move very fast at all all right I think we have talked enough about these ants I think we can carry on going but not before I want to pick up this let me show you this is the dung the fresh dung of a scrub hare one of the rabbits rabbit-like hairs that we have out here and this type of dung we don't see too often rabbits um, like rats practice a well they have a digestive practice where they eat their own dung it's called coprophagy and what they do is they produce two different types of pellets they produce a pellet just like this of, of, of grass that has gone through a type of digestion, an early type of digestion in their tummies. Comes out like this. They deposit it in an area where they can find it very easily again and then they re-ingest, they eat this again. And they draw the most, mo uh, the most nutrition, the most moisture that they can out of this pellet again. And when it comes out a second time, it is bleached almost white. But it's very common for us to find the dry pellets of these rabbits lying around. Not very common to find these, these newly formed pellets. And I think it's because these rabbits in this area are probably eating as much as they can to make use of the new grass. Their pellets from previous weeks have been rather poor in nutrition. But quite a nice find that in any case. All right, why don't we send you over to Byron to see what he's been up to over the last couple of minutes. So our beautiful young female leopard pulled a disappearing act on us. She disappeared completely. We must have been gone for two minutes. We drove around and we looked for the for the other leopards that I thought might be in the area. Did a little loop through the drainage line, saw the hardy doll, went back and she was gone. Disappeared, couldn't find her. Um, it just shows you when they don't want to be seen, they will disappear. So I'm not sure which direction she went actually because she was milling about. We think possibly maybe just south over our boundary. I think that uh, would be the logical explanation because we were right up against our southern boundary or for your tell southern boundary. the Juma so I'm, I'm not sure yeah interesting though but wonderful view of her this morning lovely oh sorry spider webs <laughs> lovely sighting of her um, I'm still gonna just scan this area quite carefully and just see if we don't find um, the female perhaps um, or maybe the young male been an exciting morning so far Jamie finding the lions um, and then of course it's always great having Steph out in the bush walk just scanning these termite mounds and trees just having a good look, making sure we don't miss anything. Did see tracks of leopards walking through the drainage line, um, the Mulwati, and I think it was the female. Tamira, there are indeed hyena in this area. 
um, we do see them but for some reason they've been quite scarce lately um, we used to have oh, spider hunting wasp at camp past us there um, so we do see hyena occasionally and we see their tracks almost every day they move through the areas at night scavenging looking for food now we were very fortunate early in the year we had a hyena den site on Juma and we got to see hyena every day but they've moved off they've moved into a different area different den um, probably found a different den site and that does happen at times and so since then we haven't seen too many of them but they are around and we do see them on safari live wow sorry beautiful sorry these brakes are horrific i think there's a beautiful big male water buck that just ran off there that was a massive massive male let's see if we can see him again I have seen him. I think we might get a view of him. He's just off to the right. He's moving through a thicket a little bit. Hang on. There we go. Look at that. Beautiful big male water buck. You can see those really, really big horns. The females don't have horns. He is massive though, just even his body. Very, very thick, muscular build. Beautiful big male. He would most definitely be a dominant male. It's not unusual to find male um, antelope moving off by themselves, especially the larger ones. They probably set up a bit of a territory, try and find females and then mate with them. And there it goes, disappeared. It's a lovely morning, still very nice and cool, uh, which is great. I think it's because the cool day we had yesterday, the day before was incredibly hot, wow. Very, very hot. So it's nice to have some cool overcast weather, makes a big change. And we got to see two young elephant bulls yesterday and I'm hoping to see some more elephant hopefully fairly soon before I leave. It would be great to find a nice herd of elephants somewhere. A lot of birds calling, um, wood and kingfishers calling at the moment. I could hear one calling behind us. Wonderful woodland kingfisher call. All right, I'm gonna continue searching this area very carefully. I just want to make sure we haven't missed anything. While I do that, let's head over to Jamie and get an update from her. And as Byron said, the bird call, birds are chirping away this morning. It is a really, truly beautiful morning. Unfortunately, we have left the lions um, so that we can make space for some of the other vehicles. Everybody seems to be up and about this morning, much like the birds. And because there are other vehicles in this area, we've made some space for them to go and enjoy this particular sighting. And I will be listening to the Game Drive channel for any updates as to what these lions are up to. And I'll... If we have a chance, then we'll go back before the end of drive, before the end of the sunrise safari. So now I'm cruising along the northern boundary of Juma, just taking in the views, enjoying the, the sun breaking through the clouds and warming us up, and looking for the ground hornbills that are always, always, I say always, <laughs> that's, that's a really silly thing to, really silly word to use out here. The ground hornbills that are often 
in this particular area. No sign of them this morning, um, but that might have just been that they've already moved off to feed. So a ground hornbill is a big turkey-sized, very endangered bird that we get out here. It's turkey-sized, it doesn't look anything like a turkey. It's a beautiful glossy black with a bright red face and they live in quite unique family groups. And they are, as I said, very endangered, but they do, at this time of year, they do start to breed. They start to lay their eggs, which means they are far more vocal than they might otherwise be. And over the last, since I've came back from leave, which was the beginning of November, if I remember vaguely correctly, I'm never entirely sure where I am in space or time, but I think I came back around the beginning of November. And ever since then, every single morning, somewhere, I have heard the call of the ground hornbill. And it does make me wonder that whether or not they're nesting in this vicinity, somewhere close to the northern boundary. Unfortunately, this morning, no luck. Our ground hornbill have evaded us completely. We'll keep checking though, because I've said that before and then found them. They, they have a strange ventriloquist effect to their call. It makes it sound as though it's coming from closer than it actually is. Especially on a cold morning like this morning. So we'll see. I have not yet given up hope. I'm also checking the northern boundary for any sign of tracks from Vula. Because Vula spends a lot of his time in the northern the property to the north of us. And Vula is a is a male leopard that I have not had really had the pleasure of getting to know. Um, he, he was actually moving out of Juma by the time I started working here, so I've only encountered him a couple of times. But it's been quite a while since we last saw him, and I just want to check and see whether or not he's come wandering down this road at any point. And then we'll do a full circuit, go look for Shadow, and then come back to the Ngohumas. It is dramatically noticeable. It feels as though we're driving in a different world. In the last, if, if I look back on the last four weeks, since the rains, prop, well, since the first proper big rains, no, because the first proper big rains actually only happened on Juma and around Juma. So it was, the place was teeming, teeming with elephants and buffalo. And with their absence, it almost feels a little bit empty. Yes, we've got we've got the lions and the leopards and that is wonderful. But it really does feel like we're driving in a completely different place. The change is that dramatic. Ooh. That could be quite cool. Of course, you're not going to stay, are you? Because you never are. Oh, you got it. Well done, genre. It is a what looked like a red bulled wood hoopoo. I had a moment where I thought it might have been a scimitar bull. No, it's not. It's a red bulled wood hoopoo, or a green wood hoopoo as they are now known. And. It's gone. <laughs> the joys of live wildlife filming, and particularly live bird filming. Uh, while we continue on in search of anything this morning, let's head across to Bushwalk to Steph who's good at finding everything. I've got an interesting thing to show you over here, absolutely. And I think, I'm going to say what I think it is. You can take a screen grab if you want, and we can keep it for later analysis. But I think that this is the home of a bagworm. Now bagworms are interesting little things. They get born and basically from the second they are born they construct a shelter out of little twigs or thorns or whatever substrate is closest to them, grass in, in, a, in many species instance. This one has used uniform sticks cut to a uniform size and I think it's still in here. Now while they're immature, both the male and the female bagworm live inside these little homes. But as they mature, when they become adults, the females stay inside their bags for their whole lives, eventually emerging as a bagworm moth um, from their little cocoon, leaving behind their homes. The males, 
when they become mature, they leave their, their, uh, their, oh, we're going to quickly send you over to Byron, he's got a big surprise for you. Keep going. Wow, look at this everyone, a black mamba. Um, Brian, there's a little gap at the bottom there, there, can you see the head? Look at that. Oh, wow, this is incredible and you all know I love snakes, but this, uh, and this was an incredible spot by Brian, he saw it right at the top of the tree, there were a lot of birds up there, and they were, um, I think they're alarm calling now at the snake, they didn't make a noise earlier, oh, this really gets my um, skin crawling a little bit, even though I love snakes, I've got a huge respect for the black mamba, because it is such a fast, powerful snake, and obviously very, very venomous. I'm going to try to keep a good eye on it and see where it goes. See if it climbs back up the tree. Incredible how agile they are moving through these trees. These very, very thick trees. Where's he going? He's going back up. Just trying to see where his head is now. It's amazing how quickly these snakes can disappear in the trees. Yeah. I'm just trying to see. Maybe if I go around the other side, Brian, we might have a, have a view of him again. Let's have a look. Because he was just on the other side of that branch. <laughs> this is really exciting and I love seeing little things like this, especially snakes. But... Like I said, it is a snake that I've got a huge respect for because of how fast, how powerful, and how venomous they are. Let's just have a look here quickly. And also the camouflage is incredible. So you can disappear in this tree very, very easily. Hang on, I think I see movement. <laughs> now, I don't know if I should feel I'm happy or a little bit nervous that it's disappeared and we can't see where it's gone. I'm sure it's still in there somewhere, but where I do not know. There we go, got him. Have you got him there? That's not too far in the frame. Yeah. There he is. Oh, well done, Brian. Brian's got him again. There, I see the movement. Yeah, there he goes. He's going down. Don't go down. <laughs> wow, he, he is going down. And these snakes are incredibly fast, very, very fast moving snakes. I wonder if he'll come out for us. Or usually what happens is they live in termite mounds. So he may even just disappear into a hole there somewhere. Let's see. So Brian, do let me know if you see him coming this way. <laughs> oh. I can't see him at all. And I wonder if he didn't go into a little hole there somewhere on the termite mound or in the termite mound rather. Sure, that was exciting. Very, very exciting. He did go straight down. Um, and I think perhaps found a little hole there. Let me just have a good look. 
Okay, interesting. I would have thought the birds might try to mob it a little bit more to chase it away. But I wonder if it's a case of they, they don't even mess with the black mamba. Although, no, saying that, I've seen starlings mob and chase, um, chase black mambas away. So interesting, right at the top of the tree and then, and then just moved off. All right, well, I think he has disappeared, but what a wonderful sighting. That was great. That was very, very exciting. Gee, oh, awesome. Um, okay, we're going to move on from here, see what else we can find. And while I do that, let's head back to Steph on the bushwalk. I must be honest with you that black mambas out here is one of those things that uh, keep you awake at night while you're on foot walking around in the bush. It's one of those things like an angry male lion or a, you know, an enraged mother elephant. You don't want to walk into close proximity to these, uh, these mambas. The stories that have come out of the bush here about black mamba encounters, um, negative black mamba encounters, so envenomations, will be enough to keep you high in the sky and not walking around here for a lot. Anyway, you're back to me with this bagworm that we've got and well what I think to be a bagworm the more I look at it the more I'm convinced that this is a bagworm's home a bagworm bag but as VM quite aptly described it just looking at it reminds him so much of a log cabin and that is exactly what it is albeit one that is constantly added to they produce a very very strong silk and that is what ties this all together on the inside but just have a look at this. Have a look at its attachment point there at the top. That is where it would have been stuck to the tree. And then the entrance to this bagworm's home is this soft entrance that's been camouflaged with a bunch of leaves and is being held tightly closed by what I believe to be the bagworm inside here. They have legs that they re that they pull on the inside of their bag's bag. They pull on these uh, these these the entrance and they can hold the entrance to their to their bag pretty tight. I think what I'm going to do is put it back where I found it in a second. I found it underneath this peltiforum tree. But while we before we do that, have a look at these caterpillars busy eating this bush willow here. Just have a look at that silvery color on them. Not a very common color out here, silver. You do find silver and gold out here in actual fact, colors. But it's not often that you see something with silver, as brightly silver as this particular one. What's quite interesting to me about this particular caterpillar is the fact that they react to me blowing on them. So they have a, they, ha they can react to carbon dioxide. Oh, and not now. But what this one, what this caterpillar was doing was waving its head around and I think it's because he wants to try and stick me with that furry, that furry head of his. This is the, his head side. And those hairy nodules that you see on them quite often are coated in a toxic and caustic substance that can actually blister my skin quite badly. Not meant for humans, of course, it's meant for predators of these little guys, mainly birds. And what he'll do is, if he thinks a bird is about to eat him, he'll thrash about quite wildly, hoping to impale the bird with those hairs and cause the bird to leave him alone. So it's a defense mechanism for this particular caterpillar, but it gives it the most bizarre face. Have a look at the head on this caterpillar. This fluffy head that he has, and a silver body. As to what caterpillar this is from, either a moth or a butterfly, I am uncertain at the moment. You'd be surprised how difficult it is to find decent reference material for, for caterpillars Lots of reference material on butterflies and moths, but not so much reference material on these caterpillars. He's now off to find his new leaf. He's got a friend that's in the same bush as him. Here we go. It's not unusual to find caterpillars of the same species in infecting, I think is the word I'm looking for, the same leaves. And you can just see how rapid this particular worm is busy eating that leaf. 
Just have a look at that. These semicircular cutlets with a very similar digestion system to an elephant where it goes into the one side and comes out the other side as quickly as it can and they will be accumulating as much metabolic energy as they can. It takes a lot of energy to turn from a worm into a moth and a caterpillar and they need to eat as much and as quickly as possible to get that energy stored. Now Marcel, you've asked me if this is a processionary worm caterpillar, not this particular one. The processionary worms tend to be a little bit shorter. They also tend to be completely covered in a uniform fur, so it's not different colors like this particular one is. It's covered in the same color fur and the hair is a little bit longer as well. We should start seeing the processionary worms at any time now. I mean, I would hope to see some processionary worms over the next couple of weeks and months. I think I'm going to go put this bagworms log cabin back where I found it. I actually found it underneath the tree over here. I'm going to leave it where I found it, at the bottom over there. I was actually digging underneath that roos that you can see growing at the base of, the, of this peltiform. It's the bright green tree that you see there. In that roos are flea beetles and I've been wanting to see a flea beetle pupae for the last couple of months over here. But there, alas, I'm yet to find one. Not there yet. Alrighty, let's carry on with this walk that we've got here today. I must be honest with you, it's turning into a beautiful day for a walk. Not too sunny, not too cloudy, wind isn't howling, so it's not making us all scared. Just a nice day for a stroll. See what's happening around here. No, this stump is not moving, so no looking underneath that one right now. Tell you what, while we're busy looking for something interesting to show you, why don't we go and see what Jamie's up to? <laughs> so while Steph battles with his various stumps and trees, we are almost at Buffles Hook Dam. Now I heard a little rumor that Byron saw a squacko heron. I'm not actually 100% sure where he saw the squacko heron, but that is a bird that I have not added to my Juma bird list. So that is definitely a bird that is definitely a bird that I would like to see. Now apparently all of you spotted it on the Juma dam, Jerry tells me. Um, I would very much like to see a squacko heron here. Where I, the the place that I worked before here, we had two flowing, or well, pretty much year-round flowing rivers and we used to see all kinds of things like green-backed herons and um, black herons and excuse me, sorry my allergies are playing up um, and squacos all the time but it would be very nice to add that list, to add that particular bird to my Juma bird list that I keep. I was also chatting a little bit to Jandre about the purple, to sorry the, yeah, the purple, purple to rock. <laughs> like for some reason that name today just doesn't want to stay in my head. It is a type of go away bird. No, no, it's not a type of go away bird. It's related to the go away bird. It is basically a lurie. And I will show you a picture of what that particular bird looks like in my book once we get to Buffles Hook Dam, depending on what's there, of course. Now that's another bird that I have heard, but not yet added to my Juma bird list used to see it all the time in the a river known as the Mkwitswe River. The Mkwitswe would flow, it flowed into the Salati, which flows into the Olifants, ultimately, which is one of the biggest rivers in South Africa and one of the biggest rivers in Kruger. Right, let us see what bird life is here. Perhaps our squacko heron has decided to come to Buffles Hook Dam. Uh, no. <laughs> On first glance, no, it has not. There is, however, one ubiquitous Egyptian goose. I wonder if it is one of two, and if perhaps our, our Egyptian goose pair of Buffles Hook Dam have managed to have any chicks yet, goslings. Doesn't look like it. 
<laughs> Blacksmith Lapwing. Protesting furiously at the presence of the goose, despite the goose's complete harmlessness to the Blacksmith Lapwing. And they're called Blacksmith Lapwings because their chirping sound sounds like a, a supposedly the sound of a blacksmith's workshop. So basically the banging of a, an anvil or a hammer on an anvil. Very, very vocal birds. Also quite pretty birds, underappreciated perhaps because we see them all the time. Right, what was I going to look up for you while we look at our birds? In the purple tar. Thank you very much, Andre. Thank you very much. I'm so glad one of us is on form. <laughs> purple crested taraka. That is what I'm looking for. As soon as I remember how numbers work. There we go. It is a bird that I long to put on your bird list and on camera. I'm not sure whether any of you, I'm sure some of you must have seen this particular bird at some point on the live drives. And I'm actually very interested to hear if you have. The purple crested taraco, it looks a, it looks a great deal like a, a go away bird that fell into a pot of paint with its bright splodges of blue and green. Actually, the reason that it is, well, no, actually it's not the reason it's called the taraco. There is a certain pigment um, there's actually two pigments, the green pigment, the true green pigment, and the true red pigment that only the Taracos have. So all of the other reds are caused by different pigments, but the true reds and the true greens are only found in the Taracos, and the pigment is actually called a Taraco Verdin. The rest of the birds, the rest of the bird species, their colours are combined by sort of yellows and oranges, or blacks and then the reflection of light or the scattering of light particles. So the Turaco, the Turacos are the only ones with that particular pigment. It's utterly fascinating and it's very striking in flight. When you see a purple crested Turaco, you immediately see that flash of red as they fly over you. So I'm not sure, please do let me know if you have ever seen a purple crested, purple crested? Purple crested. A purple crested Turaco. <laughs> a purple crested taraco on either on these live drives or on the Juma Dam because I'm sure I know they are here ah very valid question from Jerry to which I don't know the answer Jerry would like to know how many birds I have on my Juma bird list <laughs> lots I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure I, I don't have a number to it it's it's my list in my head of birds that I would like to see, birds that I have seen. And of course, one of our exciting things is the rare color morphs, like my melanistic Jacobin cuckoo, which unfortunately I didn't manage to get on camera, but Wildebeest did. VM did manage to get it on camera, and we didn't have any signal, but VM managed to record it. So I will, I've got to go and nag him for a screenshot of that so I can show you what it looks like. So the rare color morphs are also always an exciting thing. I'm not sure, Jerry, and all of you, I'm not sure how many birds I have on my Juma bird list since I started working here. I should, uh, since I encourage all of you to keep bird lists and to keep an, uh, a sort of a record of which birds you see, see, I should have done exactly the same. I completely forgot that this buffalo was here, or this ex-buffalo. Interesting, sorry, this is just for sensitive viewers, we're just going to have a little bit of a close look at the buffalo. I'm, I'm curious about the white stuff on its skin. And the buffalo, this buffalo died in the mud and was dragged outside of the Buffelsuk waterhole and very little ended up feeding on it. What is that white stuff? Is that mold? It does, but I mean, it can't be. Lichen can't grow that fast. It does look like lichen. You are absolutely right. But I have a feeling it's uh, not. It must be mold. Interesting, very interesting. We're seeing all kinds of new things. No, I, I mean, it really looks like lichen. But lichen is a very slow growing substance. Well, that is fascinating. As far as I can tell, although admittedly my nose is somewhat blocked, as you may have determined from the very nasal character of my voice. Um, 
I can't smell anything. Genre is it smelling? Um, yeah, I mean, it's far less than it did two weeks ago. But... Chandra says far less than it did two weeks ago, but it's still a bit smelly. It's just completely different, I mean, just from speaking from experience, it's a completely different smell a few weeks later once it's been drying in the sun for a few days. It's a, it's still not pleasant, but it's certainly not as stomach-churning as it was. This, I have to confess, as revolting as it is, I found this decomposition process fascinating. And sorry to any of you that suffer from, what is it called? That fear of holes? I was reading up about it recently. Um, what's that? Oh, a maggot. What are you doing? You're a little bit late. Is that a maggot or a caterpillar? I've seen a few of them. It's very fast moving from, it's too fast moving for a maggot. Oh, and back into one of the holes. What on earth is that fear? Try. Trypophobia, trichophobia. I think that's how you pronounce it. Thank you to Jerry, who Googled that for me quickly. Something that I didn't know existed, but apparently certain people do suffer from a fear of close clustered holes, um, and that their fear and panic attacks can be triggered from something like a, an aero, chocolate, for example, with bubbles in it. I, I had no idea. I had no idea that that was a thing. Fruits, apparently, in, in some cases, in some severe cases, people looking at strawberries with the seeds scattered all over them. They, they can't, uh, there's some, they have some kind of adverse reaction. And they say it's probably our brain responding to, to dangerous things. Because, um, of course, holes are always, oh, cuckoo, gone. I have not had much luck with the grey cuckoos. Every time I try and put one on camera, it disappears. But yes, sorry. Apologies to those of you who suffer from trichophobia. But the decomposition process of that buffalo has been particularly interesting. And actually, speaking of interesting things, since the mammal life seems to be evading us again this morning, apart from the lions, of course, um, and I, I would love to know where they managed to find a buffalo because I have not seen a buffalo in a very long time So they, they found the one remaining buffalo on <laughs> In this area. I have not seen one buffalo. It was in fact a male buffalo by the way Just an update on that. It was a male buffalo. It looked like a, a youngish male. So it was a male buffalo As to where they found it your guess. Well, I know where they found it. They found it at Sydney's Dam But the, the buffalo have been particularly absent Leopard? What? No. Ah, naughty. Naughty, naughty. It's not a leopard, sorry. It looked a little bit like a female leopard track. It is not, in fact. It is, in fact, a honey badger track. I just narrowly avoided it, so there were my car tracks veer off, is the track that I saw. I thought leopard initially. It is not, in fact. It's not very clear, unfortunately, in this light and in this sand. You'll have to take my word for it that it is, in fact, a honey badger, um, complete with the, the sort of the claw marks, just a little bit beyond the track. So it is a honey badger track. We know that there is a pair of honey badgers that live around here. Well, I've I've seen them as a pair. It might it might have been a female and offspring. It might have been a mating pair that I saw. But there are honey badgers around. It just feels like a very long time since we last saw them. When last did you see a honey badger, Genre? I I don't know. Winter. I think my I think my last honey badger sighting was winter as well. Perhaps these are a bit clearer. No, not really. No, you're right. Genre is saying the light is not fantastic. He is completely correct in that. Um, those basically look like dots in the sand. I could have, I suppose I probably could have told you that they were anything, but they are in fact honey badger tracks. They're just not very clear. 
we shall have to wait for a sunny day to add that particular one to some of your scrapbooks, your track scrapbooks. Oh, cool. Okay, so James Bear, thank you very much to, uh, thank you very much for letting us know that you did in fact see a Taraco um, on a drive in 2015. It must, it, I wonder if it happened just before I started working here or perhaps I was on leave. But thank you for sending the, that through to you. A lot of you are saying that you would love to add that to your bird list, that you haven't in fact got it on your list. And we'll have to make a special mission to try and add a purple crested taraco to your bird lists. Uh, while I go off in search of purple crested taracos and other such mystic creatures, let's go over to Byron to see what he's up to. And speaking about birds, Jamie, we found a red crested Koran and it's calling, displaying beautifully on the termite mound. Now I'm going to see if we can get it to display. It does that beautiful aerial display where it shoots up into the air and loops and then basically stops flapping its wings and parachutes down. Um, let's see, hang on. Tracker used to show me and usually if they are calling like this there's a fairly good chance that they might do that aerial display. It's definitely I think now calling back at us. On. I'd love to show you this. I can hear another one calling in the distance. Now they also do an amazing dance when they do land um, as a display. I've never seen it myself, I've only seen video footage of it. It usually happens quite quickly and they disappear when they do it. I'm not going to give up just yet, let's see. And I promise you it does work. I've seen it and I've done it before, but it all depends. They usually don't display this time of year, but th that is a territorial call that it was doing. And the aerial display is a territorial display. There's another one calling. Come on, you've got to do it for us. Sometimes patience pays off. Just seems now curious, I think. Come on, take off for us. Beautiful bird though. Watch, watch, let's see, let's see. Where's he going? Where's he going? Oh, I was running fast.
Can you still see him, Brian? Oh, well done. You can hear the other one calling in the distance, that whistle that it does, but this one now seems to be moving off. I'm just going to keep an eye on it because it may still do this display. It's going to run, I think, right behind the vehicle. Not interested in displaying for us today. Oh dear. Now it's happened before where, <laughs> where as I start the vehicle, then they um, they take off. Let's uh, let's see. I mean, I doubt it, but. No. Oh well, it was worth a try. It is a beautiful display to watch and see. No, that bird's not displaying for us. Just calling to another male, I think, in the um, in, in the not too far distance. Anyway, beautiful to see them. You don't see them that often. So nice to see the red crested Quran. Um, why don't we head back to Steph, who's still on the walk, and see what he's up to. Yep, sometimes the drabbest birds have the most amazing displays and that is definitely one of my favorite is that red crested Quran. Another favorite of mine is seeing ancient beings. I really, really like old trees, but in this particular instance, this is a little bit more animate than an old tree. Have a look at this. This is probably the oldest speaks hinge tortoise I have ever seen. It is alive. He is inside there. And I'm making my uh, assumption that this is an old tortoise based solely on the fact that you can see how these scoots have been rubbed almost completely smooth over the years. Now tortoises this large in this particular area can get up to 70 years. I think it's probably a bit high, I would say probably between 50 and 70 years. But you're looking at a our old grandfather of a tortoise here. It's just so nice to see. This tortoise has probably survived more things out here than what you can possibly imagine. Been out of lion's mouths into hyena's mouths, probably being played with by any number of predators. Seen floods, seen droughts, seen hibernations in the open, hibernations out of the open, or undercover I should say. Just really, really nice. You can see where this tortoise, this specific tortoise gets their name, the hinged tortoise is from. There's a hinge that runs over here. That's not a crack in its shell. That's actually skin that you can see there. And they can hinge the back of their shells closed, protecting their tails, which lie under this side. This is the front side of the, the tortoise. He's retracted his head into his body, covering his vulnerable parts with quite well armored front legs. Now you might wonder why we're not picking tortoises up. We don't really pick tortoises up out here. It can place them under a little bit of distress. When they're under stress they release water from a sac in their, in their small intestine right at the back here which they store water in called the bursa and it just upsets them. We try not to pick up tortoises here as much as we can. We try not to have an impact on anything here. This particular tortoise is just hiding his head away. It's something that he would have done countless thousands of times in any number of circumstances. But what we're not going to do is pick it up. He's managed to weather the storm quite well, I must be honest. Relatively few scars. It's not uncommon to find tortoises of this age bearing tooth marks on their shell and the fact that he's managed to stay out of the prying eyes of ground hornbills for this long just goes to show exactly how old he is and how wise he is. Now Lucy, you've asked what are the main predators of tortoises. 
To be honest with you, it's, it's the large predators, lion, leopard, hyena, and then the ground hornbill, the southern ground hornbill, is one of the major pr predators on tortoises. Not much else here eats tortoises when they're full grown. When they are a bit younger though, when they are young tortoises, quite a lot of animals will actually prey on them, all the way from birds and herons and storks, you name it, will squash up little baby tortoises and eat them as a snack. This is one in probably a couple of thousand that have made it to this particular age. Now what I do want to show you, which is quite interesting, is these scoots over here have obviously been worn completely smooth over the years by this tortoise moving through vegetation. But come and have a look at the back here, which hasn't seen the abrasion that, this, that the top scoots have. Have a look at the back here, you can see those growth rings there. Very, very well developed growth rings. There's an I, I would suppose there is a way of judging how old this tortoise would be by counting these rings but to be quite honest with you I don't know if it's a very accurate way of judging the age of these tortoises. I'm basing my assumption here purely on the fact that it's so large for this particular species of tortoise and has it been worn completely smooth here over the years. Real nice person or nice being I should say, not a person, a nice being to spend this morning with. Anyway, on the topic of beings, there are some primates that Jamie would like to show you. Lots and lots of primates actually, in the form of a baboon troop that if I had to guess I would say probably numbers about 30, maybe even 40 members strong. Uh, it is I don't know exactly if it is the same group that we always see in this area, but I suspect that it is. Now, it is an exceptionally large baboon troop, and it's actually wonderful to see how much they have relaxed in our presence. There was a time, and I know that many of you on uh, years ago would spend hours watching the baboon troops, um, but there was a time when I first started working here where a baboon sighting was rare and exceedingly fleeting, where the baboons would just be dashing off in any which direction. It's nice to see that they are slowly calming down and giving us a little bit of a chance to have some insight and observation into their characteristics. So there's one of the big males. And actually, no, I thought for a second he'd injured his tail, but his tail is just doing the normal thing of a baboon. Now a big male like this probably weighs somewhere in the region of around 25 or so odd kilograms, so over 50 pounds. They do, however, have canines that rival a leopard's and are actually almost as large as a lion's, at least a lioness's. Now, they are massive creatures. There's a huge sexual dimorphism between the males and the females. Now, recently, um, we, did, we had a question about the blood types of baboons because, of course, they are primates and therefore falling into the same family group as humans. It was a question that I have to admit I was somewhat ill-prepared for at um, 5 o'clock in the morning. However, it was a very, very good question. And the question was whether or not baboons share the same blood types as humans. Oh, you don't do that. I'm not going to get any closer. I'm going to try and get us into a view that we can see at least those that crowd over there. Otherwise, they're going to vanish completely. And we discussed, and eventually, thanks to many of you sending through the information, um, we learned that the old world monkeys do share very similar blood types to human beings. And I have, I have thank you for those of you that sent through the research and the scientific papers. I have to confess, I have skimmed through and not gone into the, the great depth um, that the articles go into. But it, is a f it does make for some fascinating reading if you're interested in that sort of thing. Uh, essentially, obviously, things like chimpanzees uh, have a very clear or relatively clear expression of the A, B and O blood types. Um, whereas baboons do have the antigens or seem to have the antigens, but they don't seem to be present in great levels in their blood. Fascinating things. Now, you'll see, of course, the massive swellings underneath the tails. <laughs> I, um, I always find the name quite in, quite amusing, and I don't know whether it's just because I've been pronouncing it wrong all of my life. It, they're known as ischial callosities, which, uh, for some reason, the word callosity, unless I'm, I'm saying it wrong, and initially when I first started learning about ischial callosities, I thought it was ischial, ischial callocytes, 
which to me made a lot more sense, but it is callosities. And that swelling, of course, um, it tells baboons or conveys the message that you're looking at a sexually mature individual, and in that case, a sexually mature female. Where is this little one? An immature one. So they are fascinating in terms of their dynamics and the way in which they interact with each other and the way in which they, they have a very interesting, quite unique social structure in that they're led by a couple or, or at least protected by a couple of dominant males. So it's not like, well, it's, I, I don't think it's really, you can't really compare them to lions or anything like that. Um, they have a couple of males that share dominance. You don't have one particular group that is, or one particular individual that is more dominant than the others. They're known as the Godfathers, and that social structure is known as oligarchy. And I, I mean, many of you will know this about me, but I have to confess that I have a residual childhood I don't know, I wouldn't describe it as a dislike. I don't dislike any animals, certainly don't dislike baboons, but there is a certain, certain residual childhood reticence when it comes to baboons. Uh, having been chased and, and terrified by them more than once as a child, and I think most, you'll find most South African children did. Where did they all go? They've all vanished. Now, uh, David, in Napa, speaking of our oligarchies, you wanted to know how many males could be in a big group. Unfortunately, sorry about this. We're going to be talking about baboons for a little while whilst looking at Nyala, um, but that's because our baboons have all but disappeared. David, I'm not sure what the maximum is. I know that there's sort of usually around three or so, depending on the size of a, b a baboon troop, and baboon troops can be up to 40, 50 members strong. Um, so you can get four, you can, you can, I have seen up to six big dominant male baboons in a baboon troop before. As to whether or not that number goes higher, um, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I think they will, you will find that there will be a cutoff limit though. Um, it, oh cool. <laughs> that was very, that was very well posed of those Nyala. So David, I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure what the maximum number of oligarchs there are or godfathers there are in a baboon troop. I wanted to share that the story of the Inyalas. Um because we got we got asked yesterday about whether or not there is a, a local legend as to why the male Nyala, which look completely different from the females, um, have these dark grey brown coats, but they have tan stockings. And apparently one of you, and I'm not, sorry, I'm not 100% sure who it will, oh, there we go, Winter Prism, Winter Prism on YouTube sent through there, because we were talking about whether or not we should make one up, because I, I didn't know any local legends about why Nyala Bulls have stockings. But the um, Winter Prism did send through a lovely <laughs> made-up just-so story that the um, female Nyalas got stuck in the mud, a female Nyala got stuck in the mud, hence why they are that tan coloured. Perhaps even you could go so far as to say they used to be white and then those are the only bits that they could manage to clean, just to add to Winter Prism's story. Um, and then the male Nyala went in to rescue her and as he walked into the, the reddish mud, he didn't have to go too deep in order to save her, so he ended up with reddish stockings, but the females were covered in the mud and therefore turned red themselves. This is not, of course, a <laughs> true depiction of why it is that Nyala are the colour that they are, but it is a lovely story. And since I haven't managed to find a local legend explaining why it is that Nyala bulls have stockings, I thought that was quite an appropriate one. So thank you to Winter Prism, if in fact you are watching. If you are not, thank you anyway. <laughs> Unfortunately, our baboons and Nyalas have completely vanished, but I think that we should head over to Steph on Bushwalk to see what he's up to. We're not up to too much. We've managed to get to Trias Dam eventually to see if we can see that hippo who with the runny tummy uh, that we saw the tracks of a little bit earlier on today. And as you can see, Trias Dam is vacated at the moment. So that can only mean that that hippo did a little bit of a long walk last night and is probably either in uh, uh, Twin Dams 
or in the big dam at Chitwa, which is a neighboring reserve off to our southern boundary. Not too far, it's either is possible. Hippos can walk an extraordinary amount of um, distance over an evening. It has been recorded of them walking up to 30 miles or so in one evening from one water source to another. That's unnecessary in this particular area, so I doubt that he'd managed to walk that far. But it's good to know that he's not here anymore. This was a little bit exposed. It's not that deep. Uh, that is the water table at the moment, so that is not just rainwater. We haven't had such substantial rains over the last couple of days that uh, that uh, that it would have filled up. So that is the water table right now, and um, it's that not that deep. It's probably about knee deep, I think, at its deepest level, if that even. So for a fully grown hippopotamus to be lying out here in the exposed sun over the last couple of days, definitely not the best thing. They're going to need some mud, they're going to need some, uh, they're going to need some shade, probably a little bit of deep water. The perfect water for hippo is slightly shaded, deep enough to submerge their whole bodies, but where they can stand and just keep their nostrils, just the tips of their nostrils, out of the water, breathing every now and again before dipping their head into, uh, into the bushes. Now, I've been remarking over here while we've been uh, waiting for uh, well, waiting to tell you about the hippo in Trias. <clears throat> this dam wall was, was uh, not reconstructed, it was strengthened at the beginning of the dry season. I think it was around about May or June, have you? I can't really remember. But you can see how quickly the dam wall's plant communities have come back. I've been amazed at sitting over here and looking at how quickly the grasses, the different grasses um, and plants have managed to seed themselves here. All generally speaking quite hardy things, but what this is doing is it's stopping the soil erosion on the sides of these of this dam wall and will stop weakening of the dam wall itself. And what is quite nice is this particular grass. This grass is the most amazing way of, it's been used as a kid's toy here for a couple of years and I'm going to show you what they do with it. They put it between their, their arms like this and they make it walk <laughs> and it hides itself. Now what you're having a look at over there is a marvel of mother nature. That is how these grass seeds bury themselves and it's why this grass is such a successful pioneer species of grass. So this grass is able to bury its seeds in the movement of the soil. So soil does move, it moves through water, it moves through wind and it moves through insects burrowing into the soil. But without other plants there, or without ants taking the seed into a nest, this plant has had to figure out how to get its seed buried in an area that has no other plant. So most other grass seeds wait until the grass seed rolls along and hits a barrier. This particular grass seed can bury itself. Let me just do it for you again. And it does it through a bunch of hooks. So the movement of the soil. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> <clears throat> and it does it through a series of hooks that you can see over there that hook into the soil, all pointing in the same direction. And as the soil moves, the seed gets wedged in the cracks deeper and deeper and will find purchase and there it will germinate and there it will become one of the pioneer grasses, one of the grasses that can populate an open patch of sand. Mother Nature, she does well. Not to say Mother Nature does like soil erosion. Plants don't like soil erosion. So it's up to plants to really stabilize areas, open patches of sand. And they do it with these fantastic kids toys, like I say. A bit of a magic trick for kids. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Now, okay, you've just asked me if we ever get any water runoff from the mountains. We absolutely do. But because the mountains are about 90 miles from where we are, 80, 90 miles from where we are at the moment, um, the runoff has already uh, uh, come together to form river systems at the moment. So we have a couple of river systems in this area. We have the uh, Willy Fonts River, <laughs> excuse me, the Klesiri River, <clears throat> the Timbavati River, um, what else is close by over here? Probably just that. The Sand River, oh yes, the Sand River and the Sabi River. Those are the four or five biggest rivers that we have, and the Manuleti River. 
most of these are tributaries of, of, of two large rivers, the Ulifants and the Sabi River. So by now, the Ulifants and the Sabi River lie a few miles off in that side. It's probably say about 20 or 30 miles off in this direction. So we're in between the small streamlets that come off over the mountains, uh, but before we get to the really large rivers that take that water to the sea. And so we have these drainage lines that are quite big, um, but are relatively seasonal. So close to where we are now, we've got the Sand River that flows most years, most of the year. Um, we've got the Sabi River about 30 miles or so in that direction. Um, that flows all year round. We've got the Ulifants River which flows all year round as well. Um, although it goes down, they go down to quite shallow, probably about waist deep um, as an average depth over all of it. Right, let's carry on. No hippo here, so I can't show you, well I can't, I wasn't going to show you his runny tummy with fear of being stepped on in any case. We might as well go and see what is going on down here in this direction and uh, down this drainage line. It's been a long time since I've actually walked off here and seen exactly what is going on down here. Now Dale, you want to know when does our rainy season start? Dale, um, we've already gone into our rainy season. The rainy season here for me at least starts uh, as soon as we get about 20 millimeters of rain, which is about this much of rain. We had that in October this year. I can't remember the exact date, but it was on David's birthday, our, one of our cameramen's birthday. Um, we had our 20 mils of rain. So for me, that's when the rainy season starts, except that it's sort of, it stutters its way through to Christmas and into the new year. Our true heavy Heavy rains fall anywhere from January through to about the beginning or middle March about with the last few big rainstorms happening at the end of March into the beginning of April and then by the 1st of May I judge our dry season, our wet season over at least anyway. So we have wet season from October through to May and then the dry season from May all the way through to October again. All right, now on that note, why don't we send you over to Byron, who's got something exciting to tell you or show you. I didn't quite catch what that was. <laughs> Do I have something exciting? Not quite yet, Steph. Um, I was hoping to find the Unkuhuma Pride again. I know they were around this area somewhere. So I'm having a good look. Just to see if we can find them. But it's starting to warm up, so I wonder if they haven't moved off into the shade, perhaps. Let's have a look around here. I don't see anything just yet. Um, because apparently they were chased off their kill this morning. I'm not sure why, uh, or what really happened. It's starting to warm up really nicely now. I don't know, I don't see any lions anywhere just yet. We'll see what else we can find. I just thought I'd drive around and just have a look if they were out in the open somewhere, but they possibly just moved into a thicket. Um, and I know Jamie was fortunate enough to get to see them on the kill this morning, found them there. So that is great. Another buffalo yet again. A beautiful magpie shrike flying in front of us. Let's see if it lands. And there we go. Up at the top of the tree again, the glare. It's a bit difficult to see some of these birds. Makes it difficult. But luckily we can adjust the camera. Thank you, Brian. Can hear a red-chested cuckoo calling in the distance again. I haven't seen one for quite a while. They, I mean, they, as we know, the cuckoos are quite secretive. A little difficult to see. You hear them all the time, but then you struggle to see them. 
Nice to see this little magpie shrike. It's amazing how it uses that tail to balance itself in the wind right on top of that on top of the branches. There it goes. <clears throat> I saw tracks earlier of a big bull elephant, really lovely large tracks, but it looked like from um, either very, very early this morning or actually last night, I think, because I saw some other tracks on top of it, impala tracks and that. But I was hoping that maybe we'd bump into him along the way, but no luck. Stay there, a beautiful emerald spotted wood dove. Stay, don't rat, don't fly. Look at that, emerald spotted wood dove. Oh, there it goes, but luckily you could see that beautiful little emerald spot on the wings. You caught a glimpse of it there. And it's nice, the emerald spotted wood dove. Lovely little bird. some impala up ahead. Just the one it looks like, uh, just a male that's running off. Oh, we've had a very, very lucky morning, I think. I mean, for all that we've seen already, the lions and then uh, the young leopard this morning and, um, and those hardy dart chicks. That was interesting. That was something really wonderful. Virginia, you wanted to know if those hardy dart chicks would be in danger from any predatory birds. Um, I, most definitely, Virginia, like all chicks, you know, they are vulnerable up in the nest. But um, but it looked quite well hidden up in the canopy of that tree. Um, and they are quite large, but I'm sure if, um, I mean, a bird like a gymnogene, for example, the, or the, uh, the, I mean, the African harrier hawk, if that found that nest and found those chicks, it would definitely kill them and feed on them. So they, they, they are at risk, but it's like any bird, though. Any bird is at risk uh, in the nest. Um, as long as, who knows, the females are around, maybe they'll be able to chase away any potential threat. Sure, it's really, really bright now. There's a very, very harsh glare. I think it's because of a bit of the cloud cover and that too, so it makes it quite difficult to drive around and see. Maybe we should put, um, get those, uh, what's it, they've got um, the football players, American football players, players put the, um, put the black markings under the eyes apparently and it helps for bright lights. Maybe we should start doing that, Brian. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to continue searching for whatever we may find. Let's head over to Jamie and get an update from her and see what she's got. Well, there is something extraordinary about woodland kingfishers, and in fact, oh, bye. <laughs> let's rephrase. Let's just let's just rephrase that completely. There is a certain inevitability um, with with the odd mornings such as these, where no matter what you try and get on camera, they seem determined to thwart you. They're not, of course. They're wild animals on their own schedule. And it's just our job to try and bring you these beautiful images. Well, at least we got a view of it. It was such stunning light for that particular kingfisher. Aha! 
may see you, but now I've, my angle's all wrong. He's on the edge of that branch there, Jandre, on this big bush willow, the one that curves off to the right. The, the big bush willow, if you zoom in, and then he is to the right of it. <laughs> um, um, well, I can't, <laughs> the glare's reflecting off my monitor. He is, oh dear, he's there. <laughs> there he goes. <laughs> oh, it is the perennial guide problem to try and, you know, when you've spotted something far away, and you're trying to explain to a, to a guest where to look. It's something that you, you slowly get used to. Um, luckily our cameramen are on the ball. Okay, yes, that was slightly blind, but I hear you. That was a difficult one. I, I, I concede our cameramen, genre included, um, are on the ball when it comes to seeing things like that. But you do find yourself when you're describing the position of something to a guest, going, the, the tree, the tree with with leaves, you know, <laughs> the big one, and then being absolutely at a loss as to how to describe it any further. And that does invariably happen. Trying to describe, uh, I find it particularly if you go to the Kruger, if you do a little trip around the Kruger National Park, because of course you can't off road, it's, it's a very different scenario, it's a very different setup, and Often you'll pull up next to a vehicle and they'll be trying to describe to you where they've spotted this leopard at 300 meters. And it, it, turns into, it turns into a very interesting mime and caricature or I don't know how to describe it. And they're, they're pointing frantically but of course you can't see where they're pointing because you, you're at a different angle and a different perspective. It does make for some very entertaining scenes. Fortunately though, you did all get to see that Kingfisher. So while I look for, go and look for something that stays still, um, take up, didn't stay still. Um, <laughs> while I look for something that stays still, perhaps Steph has had some more luck. <laughs> I haven't had much more luck with living things today. We're also just doing static things today. But look at this, it's not, it's been quite a while since we've actually had hyena with any sort of persistent presence on Juma. But this, what we're having a look at over here, what I'm busy rolling around here, is the hyena scat, hyena dung. And it bleaches white like this in the sun because it contains quite a high percentage of potassium and calcium. Now, hyena have got these massively overdeveloped jaws, or overdeveloped jaw, jaws and muscles, and they use it to crack the marrow of bones. Now, the marrow of a bone lies inside here. Now, the marrow of bones is, is, is necessary for us and in, 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 in mammals because it produces blood, red blood cells as far as I know. And look at how thick the wall is of this particular bone. You can imagine what it would be like, what strength it would take to crush through that to get at this marrow. Why marrow? Marrow is incredibly rich in fat and fats out here are very difficult to get. So hyena have developed these over, over developed uh, jaw muscles not only to get to marrow but also to dismember carcasses. But basically what happens is the bone goes into the hyena along with the marrow and comes out looking much the same as it did when it went in and it starts to get bleached by the sun, as you can see over there. Only in this particular form, in the dung's particular form, unlike the very, very hard bone, the dung can be broken down into smaller pieces. And that potassium and that uh, calcium that's available in these in these dung balls is used by a lot of animals. One in particular, uh, well, for they use, they, the animals use it for their vitamins and minerals, but one in particular that I quite enjoy is tortoises. Now we were with that rather old Speaks hingeback tortoise a little bit earlier. And when that tortoise needs to lay eggs, quite often the females will come and look for hyena dung and eat hyena dung and use the excess potassium and calcium in their systems to produce hard-shelled eggs. Now generally, tortoises will give 
will lay, not give birth, would lay um, soft-shelled eggs in the absence of a lot of calcium. Their bodies just don't produce enough. I suppose when they've got to maintain a shell like they do, they don't have enough that they eat or get from their diet. But with the addition of some hyena dung in their diet, they can actually produce hard-shelled eggs. Isn't that such a nice fact? Now, Angelina, you just asked me, why doesn't the dung beetle roll the hyena poo? This was probably produced um, uh, Angelina, when there were no dung beetles around, we do find dung beetles that do utilize hyena dung. Not, they're not as common as the dung beetles that utilize the dung from herbivores. In other words, that roll rhinoceros or roll elephant dung. But you do find dung beetles and carrion beetles that specialize in breaking down the feces and the dung from carnivores. Now, the hyena are definitely carnivores, they've got a large bacteria count in their feces. This one is very dry, but I'm still not going to pick it up. It's just a bad habit to pick up anything, that, or the dung from anything that eats meat, at least anyway. So, my prediction for you is that this was, this was deposited at some point where there was no dung beetle activity, so in the dry season somewhere. How old this is at the moment, that is actually quite tough to say, to be honest with you. It could be this year, beginning of the dry season, a couple of months old. Quite hard. Now, um, I, can't, I couldn't quite catch the name there um, for the next question, but it was a question coming from Red, excuse me. Um, Red, you asked me, would, um, would giraffe eat this dung as a form of picking up minerals? Um, Red, I suppose they could. You do, got, you do get giraffe eating bones. It's called um, osteophagy. I've seen more giraffe eat bones for calcium and potassium than I have seen giraffe eat hyena dung and it's probably got a lot to do with the fact that it's just not that safe you need to be quite specialized to be able to utilize the dung of another animal caprophagy or coprophagy as they call it whereas osteophagy is something a little bit different uh, I can see where you are blurring the lines there red and I can't really say conclusively whether or not giraffe will or won't or whether any of the even-toed ungulates um, or even-toed herbivores would eat hyena dung, but I have seen even-toed ungulates um, and all the antelope belong to that, warthogs, etc., giraffe, I have seen those even-toed ungulates practice osteophagy or the chewing of bones so that they can get the minerals, some, some uh, trace minerals and elements that they need in their diet from the bones. I absolutely have seen that. So, undecided there, Red. If I were to give you a conclusive answer, my exam question would be no. They don't eat hyena dung. Giraffe don't eat hyena dung, but they will chew on bones. Alrighty. And on that particular note, I think let's carry on going. Watch out here, VM. You're going to get stuck your aerial there. Let's just see what we've got going for ourselves in this bush. This is one of those Bushman's grapes that infest the, uh, the, 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 the area around the tent where James so often has found himself. And at the moment, this Bushman's grape is ripe. Now, I haven't tasted a ripe Bushman's grape in years. I couldn't possibly tell you what I'm about to taste right, right now. Well, the initial hit is very sweet. Almost sultana sweet. Wow. I'm not going to chew it too much. Wow. That is amazing. Mm. It doesn't have a lot of fruit on it. This particular seed. Wow, that is delicious. This particular fruit. There's one there. That is an unripe one. The one that's just about to get ripe. And we've got this tree's hasn't been visited by a baboon troop, otherwise they would have eaten a lot more. Here's another one that's ripe now. Also, just on the far side of ripe. Now, this tree obviously attracts birds, birds that eat fruit, frugivores like the uh, luries, the gray lurie or gray go away bird and the purple crested lurie. They would eat this whole. It's a nice prize, looks good. Inside their crop, they have a bunch of stones, and as you, and the stones would help to break down these fruits, and that's why the it itself 
There's a lot of good tasting juice, but only a little bit of fruit, you can see there, surrounded by the pip. The bird would then swallow that. In their crop, that meat or the fruit would be taken out. The bird would utilize that for its own metabolic purposes. And then the seed, which as you can see is quite sticky, would be coughed out. So the bird would cough out the seed and probably wipe it onto a branch, as you can see there. And that's how you'd find these seeds all over the place. And then the next Bushman's grape would grow. So definitely from a, from a, 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 a this Bushman's grape attracting birds, frugi frugivorous birds, birds that eat fruit. And that's its dispersal mode. All right, we are gonna send you over to Byron. Now look at this beautiful bird sitting on top of the branch. Oh no, there it goes. Oh dear, it is a white browed scrub robin. And I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's one of James's favorite birds. It's got a beautiful call and I drove past, reversed, got to it, sat here and as you got to us it flew away. But beautiful bird, they've got a very melodious call. Most of the robins do. Um, it's always nice to see them. Unfortunately, that one flew away, but you never know, we might see another one. White-browed scrub robin. Beautiful call. <clears throat> I'm going to see what other birds there are around. Excuse me. Uh, temperature definitely is warming up. I think it's going to be quite warm again today. This cloud cover is most likely going to burn off. That's usually what happens in these areas. Just scanning through here, it is quite thick around this area. <clears throat> Never know what we could bump into. I'm really, I still can't believe how quickly that young leopard disappeared this morning. <clears throat> and Dina, um, Thank you very much for the compliment. You said we're all very good at spotting wildlife and creatures in, in the bush. And do we have any tips for you? Um, wow, Dina, I think, you know, the more time you spend out in nature, um, the better it is because you tend to then uh, tune your eye into certain things that you might be looking for. So that does help. Um, trying to think what else. Uh, I think it's a case of don't just scan. Look for look for something that that appears to be standing out that that shouldn't be there. Um, for example, if you're looking at trees, uh, you know there's. Uh, let me look for an, uh, a little example. Even if it, it's not something that uh, that is an animal, but you start tuning your eye into certain things like. Just scanning around, I can see the shape of birds. Um, there's some starlings that just flew off over there. Um, and then, um, and then, as we scan, I can see. And then you pick up movement too. And there's a little bit of movement off to our right. And there are some impala. They are out in the open a little bit, so it makes it a bit easier to spot. But but if you're scanning like that, you can just see. That looks a little bit out of place, that brown coloration. And with insects, insects it's a different story. You just need to really have patience, look very, very carefully, and walk slowly. Take your time. That's probably the best advice I could give. Cape turtle doves calling in the distance. Work harder, work harder. Work harder. 
It's, it's kind of how they, well, I think how they sound, especially in the morning, telling us to work harder, find the animals. <laughs> I'd like to just have a look back at Sydney's dam, just see if there's any activity around that carcass that was there. Let's have a quick look. I'm not far. I wonder if the lions have returned or if maybe there's a hyena. Wouldn't that be great if you saw a hyena? Sorry, Impala. Now I see a lot of impalas standing out in the open, so doubt any predators around. Let's have a look. Where was the carcass? That's the other question. I don't see anything. Just having a look, um, and nothing at the moment. Can't see anything right now, um, but we're just scanning around and having a look. Oh, where was that carcass, I wonder? Oh, giraffe! Straight through there on the opposite side of the clearing. Let's see, I think, there we go. There we go, giraffe. Isn't that a nice surprise? When last did we see a giraffe? Quite a distance away, but always great to see giraffe. Just browsing away there at the moment. That's a nice surprise. Huh. I haven't seen giraffe for ages. I know a lot of guests that I've had in the past all love the giraffe and they are oh, beautiful graceful animals and it's lovely to see them. You'd think it'd be, it would be easy to spot them because they're so tall, <clears throat> but that's not the case. They can disappear quite quickly, just like big grey elephant can disappear in the bush. And there it goes. All right, so I'm just gonna have a look down the road. I think where that carcass is, apparently it was a little bit further down the road, not quite in the clearing. Let's have a look, see if there's anything there. Well, it seems as though Byron has lost signal. Um, as you know, bringing you live safaris, that's my, my standard set piece every time we have a, a situation where the signal disappears. Bringing you a live safari from the middle of the African bush is quite a technological feat all in itself. So sometimes things do go wrong, and we do apologize, but I'm sure he will be back up and running shortly. I'm sure as soon as he goes still, um, his signal will resurface once again. I wanted to I wanted to bring this up. Actually, I've, I completely forgot about it until right now. But we went down a rabbit hole, one of those rabbit holes that one finds yourself going down um, in general conversation. And I think Jean Ray was actually one of the ones, he was the one who initiated it, talking about horse crab, crab, horse crab blood. Horseshoe crab, horseshoe crab blood. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me today. Horseshoe crab blood. Um, and we ended up started, starting to research the most expensive liquids in the world, as you do. 
naturally when you're having a conversation on the table. Uh, and we found a list, Brent found a list, and I, I don't know fully the exact accuracy of this list, but it probably does give you a good idea. Um, so obviously the the crab, which they aren't actually crabs, but the, the, the crab blood is one of them, at, what was it, John Ray, $60,000? 60, $60,000 a gallon. Um, and then it obviously proceeded through the various lists. A Chanel number no. 5 was on that list. The top two were a surprise to all of us. Um, the top two, the, t the second one on the list was King Cobra Venom, which is fascinating to think, and I, I can't remember what it was, how much it was. I do remember about, what, 50... 150,000, okay, there we go, Genre does remember, 150-odd thousand dollars per gallon. The absolute top of the list by a long way, um, and it didn't specify this particular list, and again, I, I'm not sure about the scientific accuracy of this particular article, at the top of the list was Scorpion Venom at 39 million dollars per gallon. Obviously, it takes quite a few scorpions to provide you with um, a gallon's worth of venom. Quite a few being a, a serious underestimation of how many, <laughs> how many scorpions you need. And I'm not sure how, how, about how they came to that figure or how they've come to that figure. But it was the most extraordinarily interesting rabbit hole to fall down. That the fact that, that these sorts of... Oh, insulin obviously was on the list as well. Just while I'm thinking of the different liquids. Two little decas. Both running, both not wanting to be on camera this morning. Stop! Good girl. Thank you. Boy. Sorry. My apologies. My sincere apologies. Good boy. <laughs> there were two of them dashing past. Here we go. A grey dacre. Not often an antelope that stands still long enough to get more but a fleeting glimpse of them, so I'm glad that one stood still. But yes, back to our, back to our liquid conversation. Very interesting. The, the King Cobra Venom, obviously because of the way the, the neurotoxic effects... Oh, sorry, Dake is still there. In an unusual situation, this particular male Dake is not sprinting away. So we'll diverge for the moment from our discussion of the most valuable liquids on Earth. A very shy antelope, more so than Steenbock, which are roughly the same size. I also don't... Personally, I don't find them to be the most attractive of antelope, but they do have a quite unique mohawk that sits between their ears and those very sharp dagger-like horns. I'm sure many of you will have seen the skull in the tent that James has, just to give you an idea of just how actually potentially lethal those horns can be. <coughs> oh, over enthusiasm. <coughs> right, JB, breathe first, then talk, then swallow. No, whatever order, don't try and do all three at the same time. Um, Back to the lethal things and the liquids. Uh, King Cobra Venom apparently is used in the treatment of MS. Obviously because of its neurotoxic effects. I don't know exactly how it works. Um, and its impact that it has on nerve synapses. I don't know how it's utilized. But that is one... That's... Sorry, everybody. Uh, I was trying to respond to James, but uh, he's just telling me that there's a herd of elephants where we just drove. <laughs> as, one of, as, as is part of the course. Marcel, apparently you are googling how to farm scorpions. I would be lying if I didn't tell you that we went through a very similar <laughs> thought process <laughs> before deciding that it probably wasn't a viable way of making money and probably um, not very fair to the scorpions, although we do farm lots of different things. Um, yeah. We, we did have a, a similar conversation, we also had a conversation if, if our scorpion farming future failed, um, if, we, if perhaps the effects of cobra venom might apply to our cobras in this area as well. We finally concluded that perhaps it would be very... We, we started to then work out how much venom a 
dare I do it? How much venom a cobra produces in a day? Four milliliters roughly per day is the answer, but obviously that's very dependent on the individual and not a constant process. There you go. You learn something new every day, particularly when you live in our camp and you discuss such odd things. Hello, woodlands. <laughs> Such a characteristic call. You can see just how wide their beak can actually open. Beautiful view. Oh, bye. Oh, well. Got him. Oh, you got him. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Just the tip of the tail and then the vibrating beak sticking out on the other side. And really giving you a gorgeous view of that turquoise coloring. We're so lucky that for most of us living out here, who needs jewels when you've got birds like this flying around, living, breathing and singing? Beautiful morning. Right, I'm going to continue on since our woodlands is playing hide and seek. Woodland, sorry, Woodland Kingfisher is playing hide and seek with us. Let's head over to Byron, see how his search is going. We've managed to find some beautiful antelope, uh, the Inyala, some females and youngsters. And they're just hiding in the th shade of a little thicket at the moment. Uh, one or two lying down actually. I'm just resting. Uh, there we go. You can see one lying over there. Now I did get a glimpse of some dwarf mongoose running around here too. Not sure if we'll be able to see them. Uh, let's keep an eye out. It's so interesting to see how they're all just resting in the shade. I'm not interested in moving around too much at all. I almost forgot this morning that we also saw that beautiful black mamba, which was a Uh, a question from My World, Your Music. You wanted to know how many females will a male in Yala mate with, I assume is the question, in a, a lifetime. And uh, now, that's very difficult to say. That's very difficult to say. Um, um, I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, because it all depends on are there other dominant males around, how many females are around, how successful a male is. So there, I don't think there's a, an answer for that, to be honest. It, it could be anything. It could be, could be one group of five females. It could be 30 in a lifetime, if, or if not more. I don't know. I have no idea. It's uh, not something that I think uh, we'd be able to tell because there are so many variables that go into that, so it would be difficult to, to come up with an answer for that. Anyway, those in Yala seem very comfortable there. Can't see where the dwarf mongoose have moved off to. These brakes 
I honestly think scare everything away. There's a beautiful bird that I just saw fly past. Ah, no. It's gone, it's gone. Like most of the birds. Gone with the wind. <laughs> uh, it was a blue wax bill that I saw. We saw them yesterday at the dam. Little blue wax bills, beautiful little birds. Was it yesterday or the day before? Can't even remember now. I think the day before. been a lovely morning nice cool morning beautiful relaxing drive we did see quite a bit today which was great nice to find some animals again when was it yesterday no the day before I struggled <laughs> which happens it good it's good it's very good it keeps us humble and makes us realize these are wild animals you can never guarantee anything you don't know what you're gonna find or what you're not going to find all depends and I have got, I think, one or two more drives with all of you, unfortunately, but then, uh, then I'm off, away, back to, back home, and then, um, but I may see you in the new year again. But it has been a fun three weeks again. Always great being here on Safari Live. Always exciting and learning a lot. Sorry, I think I lost comms there for a second. Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to say goodbye for this morning and Brian and the thumb. Thank you very much, Brian We'll see you all this afternoon. Let's head over to Steph on the bush walk. Goodbye everyone You know these stumps from the Ozoroa trees never fail to amaze me They always grow in these fantastic shapes and forms but in this particular case They've provided the shelter for a potter's wasp That is the basically homes of the potter's wasp babies. She will build these pots out of clay and saliva. She'll then go and find a caterpillar, sting it, immobilize it, put it inside one of these pots and lay an egg on it. The egg then hatches and the larvae of wasps are carnivorous. They'll eat that caterpillar alive and then pupate and come straight out of the top as a young wasp leaving behind these pots. Isn't that incredible? We've come to that time of the day where I have to say goodbye. So from myself and VM, thank you very, very much for joining us. And we'll catch you again on another bushwalk. Off to Jamie you go with some bee eaters. Well, we're finishing off a beautiful sunrise safari with one of the most beautiful birds in the form of a little bee eater also known as the springbuck bird because their colors match that of our rugby team. It would be very nice if perhaps they could fly over and inspire our rugby team. Uh, perhaps we might have better fortunes in future games. But let's not dwell too long on that for I fear I might start to cry. <laughs> but yes, the little bee eater, the permanent bee eater resident of this area, and of course as its name suggests, as you may have guessed, the smallest of our bee eaters beautiful green and gold well green and yellow it's let's not exaggerate green and yellow and coloration oh oh little puffed up thing there were four of them there is now but one but they did pose for us most beautifully a really nice way to finish off our morning safari especially since we've had long discussions about the fact that our birds don't seem to want to stay still for us 
And on that note, it has reached that time again where it's time for us to do our goodbyes and our thank you. So our big thank you, a big thank you, our big thank you, I suppose is a way of phrasing it, to jean for his wonderful camera work, to Jerry and Rebecca and Final Control and the entire behind-the-scenes Safari Live team. And most importantly, a big thank you to all of you. I keep glancing anxiously in case they have returned, but unfortunately not. A big thank you to all of you for joining us, for sending through your questions and your comments. I look forward to to seeing you on the Sunset Safari. But until then, I hope you have a fantastic day. Bye-bye, everybody.